Good afternoon, everybody. Um, the mayor is not here today, um, or maybe here to join us later. He had a, 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 another uh, emergency, and we, we're hoping that's uh, that's not too serious. We have a, a quorum. I see. We do. All right. Uh, this is a a work session the village of uh, Mamaroneck. I'll uh, take a motion to uh, open the meeting. So moved. Second. Second. All right. <laughs> Got to get it. Work, it, work it out any way you want. Okay. <laughs> I, I guess we can, We as long as the three of us agree, we can do whatever we, uh, we like here, all right? Uh, so, uh, within reason, within reason. <laughs> within reason. Um, uh, so, all hmm? in favor, roll call. Um, all in favor, unanimous, unanimous. So uh, it, it's uh, it, it, there's three of us, so need to get, get too formal. All right, um, we uh, move to adopt the agenda. Uh, in adopting the agenda, which I'm happy to move, there, <clears throat> there's been a suggestion of putting the discussion off till uh, next meeting because information came in today and nobody's had a chance to review it. Um, this is the um, uh, um, 1A? No, this is one, do, 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 no, 1E. One e. We, had the we had said at the last meeting it would be number one on the agenda. Mm -hmm. And I think what we should do is make it number one on the agenda uh, two weeks from today. Uh, if the, nobody has an objection, I'd like to suggest that and move the, and move the adoption of the agenda accordingly. Yeah. Oh, I'd second that because we have um, we got information today, and I think um, HCZ, HCZM Chair Burt isn't going to be able to come today or review it. So I think two weeks is a good idea. All right. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Unanimous. We're put, uh, putting off one uh, e to the top of uh, the agenda in two weeks. All Great. right. Uh, and uh, we're we we're adopting the agenda at the same time. That the motion was already to adopt it as okay, well. Okay, great. That change. We're good. Okay. we're good. All right. So let's start with old business um, enforcement of multiple dwelling law. Um, That's supposed to be for the second meeting in uh, April. So that should also be there. It would be number two. Oh, this is this is not the second meeting. Okay, great. So that's that's postponed as well. All right. Uh, 1B then, interim report on ad hoc ethics code review. And we have ad hoc, ad hoc committee members uh, present to talk. No. They're not, oh, Dan's here. Yeah, Dan Carter. Okay, okay. okay, all right, great. Let's, uh, Dan, it's yours. Go ahead. Um, I'm not sure what you would like me to do. I don't know. Well, uh, <laughs> I, I read through this. It seemed, uh, it seemed uh, um, kind of complex. Uh, what are we? Um, what, what's the bottom line on on this uh, on this um, uh, these changes that, that you'd like to tell us about? Well, if you if you read our report, the report yeah. did December seventeenth. It goes through all of the the many changes that we have recommended uh, for the re revising the code of ethics. Uh, everything from the uh, definitions to the languages that is used to um, how the board is, um, uh, the ethics board deals with questions, with uh, confidentiality, with disclosure statements. Uh, it, if I were to take you through uh, a section by section, I, I essentially I would be reading the report because I don't, I think it is all substantive. And there are a, a lot of, of changes that we are proposing. I thought the best thing to do would be to, um, I mean, I, I could spend two hours doing that. Uh, let's not do that. Let's not do that. Let's, let's, let's then just accept the report and, uh, and, uh, and postpone any action. I guess there's only three of us here. Well, I mean, I think, you know, I think we've accepted the report. I think we have to decide um, I think I think our next step is to 
for the board of trustees to go through it. And, um, and it's, you know, Tom's not here and he's the one that wanted to do it now. I think we need to um, go through and figure out because there are, there's a draft revised law that, that's been provided to us. Mm -hmm. And I think we need to, we all need to figure out whether we want to make all the changes or some of the changes. That's and, because it, 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 it struck me as being very complicated and I'm not sure that an, uh, uh, a, an average person who would, would join one of these boards would necessarily under, understand all of it. So I want, to, I want to understand it a little more fully. Uh, Dan, you had something to say? Yeah, um, actually, I agree with you. Uh, um, okay. Uh, I think there, uh, I have several things that, uh, first I want to compliment again the committee because I think they've done an extraordinary amount of work uh, tackled some very tough issues, made some, I think, meaningful recommendations. Uh, I don't agree with 100% of them, but I agree with a lot of them. But I do agree with the effort and the substance of what they were trying to accomplish. But I do have some specifics uh, not um, of things that I'm concerned about. Uh, I think the definitions still are... Um, not in, not easily understood in lay language from people who are not um, experienced, you know, in law or reading legal documents. Uh, so when you, you know, <clears throat> I think that that gets to be an issue. I yeah. think there should be some more on transparency. Uh, I'm concerned about having the subpoena power in there. Um, I'm very concerned about um, uh, it, it, if there's an issue, there's a referral, it, it says it uh, goes to the village manager. I don't think the village manager should be involved. I don't think that is the right role. Um, I am concerned about, we have no timetables for the ethics board to act. And I think that is a major issue. Uh, if it's a land use board, I know there was discussion in at least one of the meetings that I uh, listened to that where the uh, committee talked about um, if there was a land use board that they had to do, make every effort to um, resolve the issue uh, before the next their next meeting, the next land use board meeting, or at least comment to them that they are there's an issue that they are investigating with a timetable. But I'm concerned about when somebody asks for a ruling uh, uh, or makes a complaint, um, it can sit without anybody knowing what's going on for a very lengthy amount of time. Uh, and I think that, you know, that after 60 days of, you know, something coming before them, they have to notify all parties involved and every 30 days after that, give them an update as to where things are. Um, uh, that would, in my mind, make the, uh, the process move on a more reasonable timetable. It doesn't mean that they can take the amount of time they need, but um, I know there have been investigations where all parties were, were not notified and action was taken. I know that um, people have made uh, asked for um, clarifications or, um, you know, asking for a, you know, guidance. Uh, and it has been there for many, many months and sometimes over a year. Uh, and this goes back over many, many boards. So it's not a reflection necessarily of those who are on the access committee today, but it goes back over a long period of time. Uh, no pun intended on that. So, those are the types of things that I am uh, concerned about, um, you know, and uh, I think these are things that um, Dan is right. It's now in the board of uh, trustees lap to try and go through um, and work out uh, the things that, you know, should be uh, updated and how they should be updated and agree or modify uh, um, or not accept. You know, I think that, that would be the approach. And it's not going to be, um, uh, Lou, I don't think it's going to be uh, simple to do. So I think we need to set aside some time to do it. 
you know, at a work session. Uh, there are many pressing things, you know, in front of the board right now, like not the least of which is the budget. Um, so maybe we can set some time aside, uh, maybe after the budget, because that will um, th that will be taken care of in a relatively short period of time, and then we can devote, you know, a you know maybe a meeting to that. That that would be my suggestion. Yeah, th this seems to deserve its own um, its own work session. Uh, there's a lot here, uh, 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 Dan. I, uh, uh, um, Mr. Uh, Carson, I, I uh, read in there that you, you, there were some recommendations about uh, moving some training um, responsibilities from the manager to the, the board of trustees. Was that uh, did I read that correctly? Uh, no, from the uh, the ethics board to the village manager. The village manager, I see. And uh, your 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 um, uh, rationale for the village manager was to keep it uh, what politics free or uh, no the uh, well, it should be politics free the the recommendation is based on the fact that uh, ethics training is extremely important should be regularized and rather than give it to a volunteer board that meets uh, on occasion does not have a staff um, and is not uh, paid for its work it it should. Uh, fit the pattern of ethics training that is present in private industry and in government where HR is responsible for ethics training and it is regularized and HR can keep track or the village manager can keep track of its own employees uh, for purposes of training. It, it would be, I think, highly unreliable to ask a volunteer board uh, to take on the responsibility and in private industry, which I can speak for because I came out of private industry, ethics training now is highly regularized. There are a lot of firm, a lot of private firms that administer it. It is the better choice, I think, to retain the services of a firm that administers ethics training. Uh, it can be done online. You can keep track of it. Uh, it you calendar it. You know who's taking it, who's not taking it, and it's, it's very, very efficient. And, and that's the reason we made the recommendation to transfer it from the volunteer ethics board to the, in effect, the village's own employment arm, which is the village manager. And, and, and is there, a, can I ask a question if you don't mind? Uh, sure, Dan, go ahead. Um, is there a reason that you've asked for the village manager to be responsible or the HR department? Well, I feel, I feel that is a difference. Our understanding was that there was not a formal HR department at the time we did our work. Uh, I think we were informed that there was an HR, um, there was HR staff being denominated or HR staff coming on. But since the village manager was the established hirer and supervisor of village employees, we felt that's where it should sit. But if I can speak for my committee, I don't think we are particularly wedded to which office at the village administers it as long as it is a permanent office of the village, has a budget, has the staff to uh, administer the program, and can do so in the way that almost all firms conduct such training, which is online, controls the, uh, the IT structure for it. Uh, so if the board decides, the board trustees decides that another office should handle it and it is made permanent and there's a structure given, then that's up to the board of trustees. Okay. So from an administrative perspective, we do have a, an HR department now headed up by uh, Danielle Gilliard. Uh, we have a software program, oh, speak of, not speaking of, speak of the, uh, my friend. Uh, we do have a, a system in place where uh, schedule training is scheduled online. There's an online tracking system. People have to go through the process, and it just it's uh, also set up in such a fashion that you just can't press next, 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 next. You actually have to go through the process, and it records it, it tracks it, so we we know who completes it. It's how we do the annual training for sexual harassment and workplace violence. So, and then and. And we also have some trainings that are resuming in person. So that's happening next week, I think, starting next week. 
Um, I think we should uh, um, uh, schedule this for uh, uh, its own work session at some point. Are, are we, are the three of us <laughs> yeah, <I laughs> ready think, to do that now or, or should we wait for uh, uh, I, our two absent uh, partners? I think we need to wait for our absent partners, although because I don't think we should do it at a regular work session. I think we should do it the way we're doing the budget work sessions and have a sure. separate meeting. So, but maybe let's decide to do it and then circulate some dates. Okay. We don't have um, uh, let, let's move then that we will, uh, uh, that we will, let me move that we will uh, set a, uh, a separate work session for the uh, recommendate, recommended changes to the uh, ethics um, ethics uh, rules, I guess, uh, 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 from the uh, ad hoc committee, and uh, and we will uh, uh, set that date at a later time. And Mr. Carson, you'd, you'd be available, uh, your people would be available to participate in that? If you give us the, the date that you have in mind, uh, assuming that it does not conflict with calendars, then of course we'll, uh, we'll attend. The, the most lead time you can give us, or perhaps a couple of alternative dates, uh, would be very helpful so my co-committee members can uh, attend i think if we had a critical mass of a couple of them of the six uh, that would be great um and if i may be uh, presumptuous enough to make a, a suggestion sure what, what i had in mind was that uh, the trustees perhaps would read the final report and then perhaps in advance send to us the questions, comments, criticisms that individual trustees had, such as, as Dan Edge has pointed out, and thank you, Dan, for your comments. Um, we would then be prepared to explain to you why we made certain provisions in the proposed code, what our thinking was, what our rationale was, and that might make the next session or the session that you plan uh, more efficient. And um, and, and I would emphasize that we were committee making recommendations. Uh, uh, the trustees, of course, are the, the legislators that enact the code. Uh, I'd also um, say that um, uh, we think it very important that wherever you wind up on the code, that it would be, I think, helpful for the village to retain a bill writer someone who does this for a living, so that you've created uh, a, as bulletproof a, a code insofar as language uh, and legal compliance as, as possible. Uh, and I say that because in my reading of the code, our reading of the code, there we found uh, a lot of inconsistencies in terms of the use of language terms and a, a number of places where I, I pointed out in the report, I felt there were phrases and words used that would not stand uh, legal scrutiny if they were challenged. So a bill writer who was familiar with enacting or writing laws that say the legislature passes would be, I think, a good final filter for whatever code you came up with. I, you know, right. I, I think that um, I just want to thank the committee. I, I hosted their Zoom meetings, and so I tried not to interject, but I know how hard they worked. And um, and I just, I really want to thank them. And I think our code is different. as Our code as it stands now, and probably as it stands after even we make changes, is different from other communities. And, it, and so the training that's provided by the state, while it's good, doesn't hit all of the benchmarks we need. So I think once we work with somebody who can help get a training that's ready specifically for the village, then the annual training won't be so hard. It's just getting it done right the first time. We've only had an ethics training, I mean, once since I was a trustee and I don't think they ever did it before that. So, and it was the state doing kind of the, the training for the state code, which is only a portion of our code. So um, I just wanna thank the ad hoc ethics committee for all their persistence. <laughs> It, it, extraordinary amount of work is, is evident in the report, so we, we, we thank you for that. Um, I see our um, our HR director is here. Uh, Danielle, uh, what's your uh, what's your feeling uh, as to uh, 
where this should end up uh, uh, with the uh, with the staff. I mean, is that something that uh, you are capable of handling, or is that? Uh... So I'm kind of coming in late on the meeting, but yeah. if, if it's regards to training, mm -hmm. um, you know, I I do training in a couple of different fashions depending upon the situation, but I am moving toward doing in-person training and depending upon the subject, either I can present it or I can find someone to present it for us. Um, and if I, I, when I do my training, I have a list of everyone that's supposed to, to take the training. I check off, um, meaning I have a, a kind of a sign-in sheet to confirm that whoever said they were coming to a particular training, I usually have multiple days and times. Um, I ask for a roster. I present, I prepare a sign-in sheet so people can sign in on, with their name. And if someone misses that training, I will develop an online platform. So at least that compliance part is, is done on my end. All right. Uh, um, uh, you know, let's, let's just uh, uh, decide, the three of us, that we will, uh, we will consider this in a separate work session, uh, TBA. And, um, um, and when would we do that? At, at a, would we have to do it in a regular session or can we can we set that date in a work session? I mean, uh, I, th I think we can set that date through like a doodle. I mean, I think we don't have to have a meeting to set a date. So maybe if, if I if maybe Dan Sarnoff and I would, could work on some dates and we can circulate them and we'll pick dates that work for, you know, the trustees and enough of the um, ad hoc ethics committee and Ooh. Danielle. Because Danielle's going to have to probably implement the training. Yes. <laughs> the, uh, so, because I, I mean, uh, uh, you know, I'll put my two cents in. I think it needs to be uh, be uh, uh, put uh, in, in a uh, in a format that can um, divorce the uh, the findings from personality and um, and uh, that sort of thing. Uh, um, and I think it, I don't think the, the board should necessarily directly be involved in, 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 in that part of it. But um, let's, let, let, so let's uh, agree, we will, we will have a separate work session. Um, uh, I move that we have a separate work session scheduled perhaps in, in May. Uh, um, and uh, we, will, uh, we will address that, make sure that all the participants can, uh, can attend. Is that uh, is that a motion that anyone will second? Second. Okay. Um, I think it's a great motion. I would just say May or, or early June, just in case dates don't work out, because we've had problems before. All right. All right. Um, so moved. Uh, uh, I'll second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, all right. There we go. All right. Thanks, Dan and Danielle. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. All right, next is a rental registration program. Um, that, just, that would be... Excuse me, I just want to let you know, Bob is running late. I know he had some comments. Is it possible to postpone this item until a little bit later when, he, when he's on the call? Yeah, yeah. Sure. Okay, yeah. okay so we're going to postpone this till later today. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, but, but he's just running late. He's driving back from the city, so... Okay, and we're waiting for whom now, please? Uh, Robert Spalgini. Hmm? Your, village attorney. Oh, your village attorney. Yeah, all right. We, we, we ain't doing this without him. All right, there we go. All right, so that's a, that, that we'll hold up, hold that one. Um, one D planning projects. No, that's on for April 25th, regular. Uh, okay, yeah, it's a regular uh, uh, on for the um, April 25th meeting. Zoning strategies to encourage and support all affordable housing development. Um, Completion and comprehensive plan update, development moratorium for properties in C1, C2 zoning districts located in a federally mapped floodplain. Um, we want to simply put that on the on the uh, the uh, agenda in two well, weeks. What do we want I, to talk you know, about? I, you know, we, ha we have Neil here. We have our planner here. He's in the waiting room. We have the planner who's been working on this, so we might want okay. to. Yeah. The, the, uh, Neil was supposed to give us a outline for yeah, to yeah. consideration to move forward, and we have not yet received that. He so, did. Dan, if Neil can Dan, give us a quick update, him, about, right. that he would did. be helpful. No, right. he, he did give us. So we do have we do have the proposal for the comp plan. What we don't have is the proposal for the moratorium. We have the proposal for the comp plan to complete okay. the comp plan. 
Hello. Hi, Neil. Hi. Um, so I, I, I did, I do have, as Dan had, has posted on the agenda, the uh, streamlined version of the uh, update uh, and completion of the comprehensive, comprehensive plan. And um, just uh, real briefly in, in highlights, uh, you know, I took uh, uh, Trustee Tafur's suggestion and other suggestions to streamline the uh, the process. And I uh, and, and if you if you look at the the proposal, the memo, uh, that are highlighted in yellow are the sections that I believe we should uh, focus on, uh, which is the sustainability, uh, residential neighborhoods, land use and development. Now uh, there's, I, for the other sections, for example, transportation systems, municipal parks and recreation, I, I do wanna provide uh, the, the committees or, or, or other relevant persons the opportunity to mark up the, uh, the, the, the November 2020 draft, which was the latest version to be able to reflect any changes and things. Uh, and you know, we could certainly uh, enter those in. So. Um, well, in terms of the substances focus uh, are those four sections I mentioned, um, and as far as uh, more kind of uh, uh, process update by staff and, 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 and trustees or trustee liaisons are several of the other sections. Um, there are a few other sections, uh, for example, historic preservation was a short section. I currently say leave alone, uh, you know, if there's a, a appropriate committee that you know, would like to review that, I can certainly, uh, you know, we can certainly do that, of course. Um, and so the, uh, the, the, the budget, I think, is, uh, is now 22,500. Uh, and I, I, uh, I'm, I'm, if there are any questions about this, I'll be happy to answer that. Uh, and then I can tell you more about the moratorium proposal. Dan? Yeah, uh, Neil, that's very helpful. Um, one comment is I think not only do we need to leave it posted on the website, but we need to indicate that people who wish to comment are, you know, can certainly comment during the period of, you know, we're moving forward. Uh, <clears throat> I don't want to have people feel that they're excluded because they don't happen to serve on a particular land use or other, you know, ad hoc committee that's directly involved with one of the sections. Um, I think that they need to have the ability to uh, um, make any comments they want. You know, and eventually go to a hearing anyway, it, we should make it available to let them, you know, make their comments as we are moving forward. So, uh, absolutely. We can post uh, the November 2020 draft. We can, we can post for uh, members of the public uh, to also view and comment on. And and I do think that, especially with Parks and Rec, there have been a number of um, personnel changes on the on the boards and committees. So I think, like, giving them a chance to look through it would be helpful as well. Sure, sure. So. All right. Uh, you want to fill us in on the um, moratorium? Yes. Yeah, so uh, it, uh, it. So if you recall at the, the previous moratorium study. Uh, I brought in Urban Partners, a Philadelphia firm, and Jim Hartling was the gentleman who, uh, who, who came up with the, the calculations behind the redevelopment scenario. So uh, he's semi-retired, but he does pick and choose what he wants to work on, and he was happy to work on this along with his current, uh, along with Chris Lankanow, who is the staff person currently at Urban Partners, who uh, assisted on the, uh, the first moratorium study. And so I do have a I do have a draft memo uh, prepared with um, uh, and, and it'll follow a fairly similar trajectory as the prior moratorium study in terms of the scope of work, redevelopment scenarios, the fiscal and social impact, uh, socioeconomic impact assessments, and the traffic impact assessments. Uh, excuse me, assessments, and uh, I I have a draft memo. I'm just waiting for a budget number from our traffic group. So I apologize for the, the delay in, in, in getting this to you, but um, I, I do have a draft prepared and um, I, I could, I could, I mean, you don't, I, you don't have, a, you don't have it on your screen right now. So I, I can't really, um, we can't really talk about it in any detail, but uh, I, I can certainly send it to 
um, uh, Mr. Sarnoff as, as soon as, uh, probably tomorrow, as soon as I have the, the numbers um, that I can fill in and any additional scope materials. Uh, also, I think, you know, we've gotten a lot of comments on this agenda item today, and I know um, that it's really Tom's item. So I think, you know, we yeah. should make any decision today because I think he's going to want input. That's really, he's the one that raised this. But it's it's limited to the C1 and C2. We've gotten several comments from people who would like it to be extended to other residential areas. But I and I I, I completely understand that because mm -hmm. resident sing, you know single and two family residential areas which surround these commercial districts were were very significantly hit during the flood. How much different would that study be? Well, uh, I believe in the last study, um, I do have actually, I, ha I did put a, I have a map actually in the, in the proposal, which is on my screen right now, of course. Uh, and, and I, do no I did notice the RM3, the, the RM3 districts. During the prior moratorium study, we did look at the R4, but I think the, the main distinction uh, that the, at least, well, I'll, I'll, I'll certainly let the mayor speak for himself when he's available to, was um, the the infill housing provision, mm -hmm. and uh, you know where there's currently it's it's a commercial zoning district, uh, mm -hmm. C one and C two, uh, and through the infill housing overlay, there is potential to uh, to build uh, multifamily uh, housing in this district. And the concern was creating new development, which potentially puts um, uh, which potentially increases the cost of services, emergency services, potentially puts people in harm's way. And so um, I think in terms of if, if there's interest in expanding it, um, that's possible. But I think I, I do know, for example, there is a property um, that has an application. Uh, it's right in front of Columbus Park uh, where there is a, a small building that is going to be converted into a um, into a, a, a potentially into an into a apartment building, and mm -hmm. I noticed that, and that's in the RM three because one in in my conversations with Jim, I, I had forgotten that that district is not uh, commercial, but I said, well, you know, technically speaking, if you're if you're building a new building in place of the current building from a you know, it's it's potentially uh, alleviating and so, to some degree um, uh, because it was built to floodplain regulations above above base flood uh, base flood elevation not notwithstanding of course you are you know the, there's other factors that go into that but um, we but but I remember then that that property is not within the um, the C1 uh, where you're converting commercial into multifamily so uh, but to answer the, the question in, in a long way, I mean, it's it's quite possible to extend that to include the RM3. Um, it'll just be a little bit more calculations and uh, uh, than than uh, the uh, than what I cur currently have in the proposal. Dan, yeah, um, Neil, that's helpful. Um, I think. Other than just talking about C1, C2, RM3, or RM4, uh, I think part of the issue in which the flood committee brought up uh, is anything in the floodplain, which is a different concept than whether you're in the RM3, RM4, or, or you know, in a C1 or a C2. It's a different, it's a different approach to the same issue. You know, because the the concerns they were having and had has to do with emergency services, you know, uh, et cetera, et cetera, um, and that that <clears throat> that doesn't resonate in terms of specific zone because properties can you know be in two zones or et cetera. So that's one thing. The other thing, um, and I've had problems with other. I'm not suggesting your studies. But other studies that have concerned themselves, quote, with traffic, the emphasis has been on vehicle traffic as opposed to pedestrian traffic. And there is a big concern in this village uh, of making pedestrian crossings and pedestrian uh, ways um, meaningful uh, and much safer 
And they that seems to have been sort of a minor aspect of what people have looked at in the past. Mm-hmm. You know, the, the concerns that I hear is, well, if you do this, the traffic is going to be, you know, take longer to get from A to B and B to C. Um, and so there needs to be some type of equilibrium for keeping traffic reasonably moving, but maybe not fast moving because everybody's complaining that people are speeding, you know, between, you know, between lights, if you will, or to make the next. Um, so maybe built, you know, we need to look at, you know, maybe we need red lights, if you will, and four way stops or things like that to allow traffic to move, but also make it safe for pedestrians and have some type of equilibrium between the two. Uh, right. I, I would agree. And that's, you know, that's, that's a whole traffic engineering conundrum now where everything's based on level of service. Uh, which is very unilaterally about vehicles. Um, I think that I think the methodology can be adjusted, and um, I can work with the, the traffic engineer to 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 create a scope that's more balanced uh, and not single-handedly about vehicle congestion, but factors in safety for pedestrians uh, and bicyclists and other 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 users besides cars. So what I'd like is if you could do that and extend it to the flood plain, if you will, i.e. areas that are known to flood. Um, because you're that- talk, you're, you're talking about the uh, what he'll do during the moratorium, right? That's correct. Yeah. I.e., I, I, <clears throat> instead of just simply saying C1, C2, uh, there is some overlap in flood plain and then there's areas that are not overlapped in flood plain, which is great. I think that, you know, that that needs to be come forward, but there are lots of areas that are flooding, you know, in, you know, the area that we've been concerned about of recent date um, that aren't in the C1 to C2. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Just, just, so, just so we need, we not, need to, we need to define that, uh, the area, uh, first of all, uh, and I, we're gonna have to wait for Tom on this. Uh, um, but I hear what you're saying because if that area near the park is not included, uh, we need to probably address that. And I, well, I think we have to wait for Tom on it. I think there are questions we can ask. So because I think I, I sure. think we can anticipate. And so one is that you know Tom's really interested in doing the C1 and C2, and that's what our moratorium is about. The proposed moratorium law is C1 and C2, and but. But I think a lot of residents who support this are interested in having like a pause in the residential districts that Dan was talking about. Um, but that's not infill housing. It's a different. It's a different kind of zoning. So I guess my question to Neil is: Are they different kinds of studies? And is it better to, you know, I mean, if, if all we're looking at is um, a consideration of infill housing? then, you know, in the C1 and C2, are we better at looking at the, I mean, I'm looking at the zoning map, there's RM2, there's, you know, there's two family, there's three family all around it. Are we better off at looking at floodplain studies in, in a, like, are, are we better off compartmentalizing them? Um, also knowing that six weeks ago, and I don't think we've done an RFP yet, but six weeks ago, we, the board of trustees decided to use some of our, um, the money that we got from COVID relief to underwrite studies in the flood zones, just right. figure out, you know, how, you know, to sort of get, do some engineering work so we could try and figure out how we can um, drain some of the flood zones when it rains. So are the, is it, I mean, it just seems to me like it's such a, they're, they're both a huge, together they're a really big project and they seem to be different parts of a different, different parts of a similar project, but I don't know, like maybe the methodology is to do them separately. Um, could I share my screen for a minute? Please, uh, please can we, can we uh, arrange it? Yeah, 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 sure, please do. Okay, uh, let's see, share. Um, ah. So this is the map I put in the uh, proposal. If it's, if it's fairly clear to you, I, I don't know, but this is the original map uh, the, the only part I didn't show is a uh, post road that goes further south. Um, but 
you know, this is the area we studied within the within the prior moratorium study. So we did do the R4. Uh, mm -hmm. And so and the floodplain covers. Mm -hmm. So in a sense, we've 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 done everything already. Uh, of course, the numbers would have to be updated, the property assessments and market values and such since it was done two, two years ago. But we essentially did the build out analysis for the entire floodplain except for the RM3 district, sorry, uh, we're not, not including single family zones, uh, mm -hmm. but the only pieces that we did not include were the RM3s on the west and east side of the Maranek Avenue. So, you know, from a methodology standpoint, we've, we, we do have all the data already. We do have scenarios for Washingtonville um, of the different, I forget what the color coding means. I don't have the legend on here, uh, but, uh, if, if it's a matter of adding RM, the RM3 zones, that would be look at the that would look at all the multifamily C1 with infill C1 C2 with infill zoning over, infill housing overlay, um, the R4 and the and we would just need to add the RM3 districts. How much time do you need to do all that? Oh. Um, uh, Depend on the calculations wise, I think we have we have all the spreadsheets. I saved everything from the previous moratorium study, mm -hmm. which helps in terms of efficiency. However, they, they would need to be updated in the numbers. And and so I, I who I'd have to I have to look back at, at the schedule we had for the prior moratorium study. Um, it took I mean, the process took about a year for the for the for the moratorium study, but it had a lot of elements and it did, you know, did kind of take on a life of its own. Um, I, I can, I can provide, I think what I will do is provide a, what I should do in this draft proposals also include first the modifications based on trustee Natchez uh, suggestions about pedestrian and bicycle traffic. Uh, whatever you decide about the areas to, if there's any interest in it in including other areas, and then a timeline so we can give you a sense of how, how long this would all take. So, I mean, I don't want to put words in Tom's mouth, but you know, right. Tom wants to stick to C1 and C2. And um, I think, you know, his mind might change after he's read some of the comments. And and but again, if we're thinking about it as an evaluation of zoning, the zoning, the zoning is different. So a C1, C2 change would be different from the other zoning changes. So maybe in thinking about it, it could be, I'm glad that a lot of the work's already been done, but maybe it could be like done sequentially. I would say the traffic part, if, if there was interest in expanding it uh, beyond C1 and C2, um, that would mean more intersections to examine with a longer traffic, traffic study process. So basically it wouldn't be, in all, the project wouldn't be as compact, but that's that's uh, just what what it is because it would be focused on C1 and C2. So really, you're looking at three intersections, primarily along Maranek, Maranek Avenue, maybe four at Halstead and and um, on Halstead. Yeah. My, 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 my concern with this discussion right now, uh, <clears throat> and I know the flood committee has been, which is where the moratorium. Uh, suggestion came from uh, a few months ago. Um, I think we need to try and do an overlay, you know, in terms of floodplain administration, you know, and for zoning. Uh, there are areas that are single family or two family uh, that are built in the floodplain. The question is, you know, what should we, what should the future hold? Should we have encourage them to be raised? Should we prevent them from being, you know, um, new new things being done at the, you know just at the FEMA level, which in uh, Ida proved to be uh, um, way under, um, you know, if people who fought, raise their houses according to this, uh, FEMA still flooded. Uh, so I think we need to take a a more holistic view to that and you know along with infilled housing in C1 and C2. If you do that, if you do the C1 and C2 in the overlay of the floodplain, 90 per, all of the area that you've shown is there. And then there's some additional area that you would be adding, but you would be adding it more from a floodplain view than 
you know, in development, et cetera. And that would be include. Does that make any that sense are, now? Uh, well, would that include? Uh, that would be primary only residential properties in the floodplain, or or also commercial properties. Uh, would be any anything you built. Anything you know, I mean that, that that that's really what you're talking about. Yeah. Um, it doesn't do any good to build something that is going to you know be flooded. Well, All I right. mean, but but the 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 truth is, what floods now might not flood later when we actually do something about the flooding. So. Well, um, uh, well it it. So, you got to got to read the core the, the core study because why it will help there's no question it will help it's not going to stop flooding why uh, and, and what it does is it reduces the level but if you take that's a look at i don't know i i get that but but uh when we're talking about the uh the army corps plan we're talking about uh, uh, the emergency um, uh cleaning of the rivers that uh, we are about to begin uh, and uh, and a number of other uh, things we can uh, undertake to actually address the flooding, which is which is the the issue here. I mean, I like that moratoriums are fine, but but uh, but what are we doing in in that time? Uh, and what are we what are we trying to uh, to ascertain? I mean, um, that's 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 the question. I mean, how much time do you need to to do this study, uh, Neil? Um, now now with. With which uh, scenario in terms of the expanse? Because this that's a that's a big project to uh, with a lot of public process that would be involved. Probably more than just like a moratorium study in some ways. If you're looking at you know the future of what you can do in in the flood zone for for residential properties, um, that that's a much larger uh, take, a, a larger uh, uh, you know. Uh, um, scope and, and objective and, and process because you're you're getting into the residential neighborhood. So um, you know I think this you know if you were if if this original potential moratorium C1, C2 um, that's compact and I don't know maybe potentially just hypothetically speaking, you know let's say it takes about three months to complete um, mm. the the moratorium study for the C1 and C2, maybe that's something that could be, that process um, could be something to inform looking at the rest of the floodplain um, right. beyond uh, just C1 and C2. That, that's, I mean, because, you know, I'm, I'm, I told Tom, I'm willing to go along with this, uh, um, uh, but not an indefinite moratorium because uh, it, Essentially, it's a de facto moratorium in, in parts of that, that area already. I mean, I've been, been there three years and I'm seeing, uh, you know, um, two and a half year old uh, zoning signs just sitting there, you know, uh, collapsing into the soil. So um, we, we we're already there on a on a de facto moratorium. Yeah. So um, uh, let's uh, I would say let's let's let, let's keep it limited and um, and, and, and see what the. Uh, if you're going to come up with it in three months on C1 and C2, I think that would be my uh, my inclination. Well, I you know I don't disagree that keeping it limited, uh, you know this because this is sort of like a world hunger project. I mean, you know we're not we're not going to be able to solve flooding in the village of Mamaroneck even with this Army Corps plan. It's going to mitigate flooding, and so if we take on something that's too big, we simply we simply okay. run the risk of not getting it done. But um, on the other hand, one of the things about the about eliminating infill housing in the commercial district is that housing has to be elevated according to FEMA so that the floodwaters can go underneath. Mm -hmm. Commercial properties don't. They can be made flood proof like with gates like they have at the Rye Y. So sure. you end up with kind of different flooding. You end up with different kinds of buildings if you allow residential versus commercial or both. And um, so, you know, that's gonna be one of the factors that the consultants look at. So, I, um, and I do think that there are a lot of residents who want this moratorium to be larger. So I, I just, if, if, it, if it's not gonna be larger, I just wanna address it now. I don't want, you know, I don't want surprises. I wanna have like a real conversation about how we decided to, to do this moratorium 
and how we decided to evaluate what's going to be there. I mean, this is not this is a problem long, long, long time in coming, and um, it's not going to be a quick fix. No, are you talking about the sufficiency? The part of the maturity study is the sufficiency of the existing floodplain development regulations for both commercial and residential properties. Yeah, I mean, you know, you, because with 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 the residential property, you have to elevate. So the parking's right. beneath, and you know, you might lose some cars, and people may be stranded, but they are hopefully above the water. With commercial properties, if you look at the AMP or you know the Bricksmore site, that's you know that's a site that flooded again because commercial properties need to be made flood proof. And so that's just, it, it's just a difference in the physical buildings and a flood, you know, a building that's elevated allows the water to pass through. A building that's not elevated, that's flood proof, stops the water maybe, and may reroute the water to other buildings. Exactly. So that's, you know, those are very different results with different kinds of development. Right, and that's what I was getting at when I mentioned the, the applications for the multifamily building in front of Columbus Park. It's gonna be built to floodplain standards and be elevated. So you, you know, so it's a different building type. Uh, it, it's technically, technically putting people out of harm's way, though, though, though not entirely, of course. Right, because if you are, if you have an emergency and emergency vehicles can't get to you, you might be high and dry and not necessarily in a good way. You know, you're out of the immediate danger of the water, but you're not able to get into that ambulance that you need to get into. All right. Um, so I, Lou, I, we're gonna, I guess we're going to have to wait on this because uh, uh, we, uh, uh, or, or you, I, I, I'm not in the mode to expand it right now. Are you? Well, last week you didn't even want it, so you're right. So what was that? Last week you didn't even want it, so you're. you're well, you're, well, you know what? I'm, I'm I'm trying to listen. I'm trying to listen, and oh, I understand. Yeah. And I've seen the same comments you have, Laura. So, uh, so uh, I, uh, I, yes, if it, if there's a if it sunsets, if we if we know what we're well, why we're pausing it, um, uh, fine. But if it's just going to be a, a policy paralysis where we're not doing anything because we're afraid to do anything, or we don't know what to do. Then it's just not a good idea. So that that's that's where where I am. And you've got these these abandoned buildings. Um, I mean, or empty buildings, not abandoned, uh, uh, sitting all over the place. It's starting to look like a ghost town. It's just not a it's just not a healthy uh, healthy environment. Well, Bob and Mark have drafted the law that C one and C two, mm -hmm. and. Um, you know, and Neil has started on a proposal with the instructions we gave him, and now we've confused him probably today, or potentially. So, you know, what, I guess, what, what more information do we want between now and two, two weeks from now? I would suggest, you know, Neil, Neil can give a proposal, um, you know, for going both ways if you want. Um, you know, with time parameters. I, I agree with Lou that we don't, I don't think anybody is looking just to put a moratorium on and just let it sit. Uh, but I do- well, that, that That is the, the, the thrust I get from some of the comments and I understand the impulse, but I don't think we can do that. No, just let, let me finish Lou, okay? okay. I, you know, I think that, you know, we don't have to study to death the floodplain but I think we need to understand how that interacts with you know, what to be, be doing. Should you be raising the houses you know, uh, should, you know, in the buildings? You know, should, um, does the should commercial be allowed not be flood proof if you as opposed to uh, raised? Um, should we change, uh, give an incentive to raise houses so that if you are a two story, and that's what you're limited to, you know, under the zoning, uh, it's, you know, the footage that you are given a pass to raise it a little bit. Those are the types of things that, in my mind, do, does not require months and months and months of study and lots of calculations. It's here are the options. 
And I think that's what we're really looking for. Here are the options, board, you decide what you want uh, and type of thing. And that can be done, you know, all due respect in a relatively short period of time. The infield housing on C1 and C2, I think is a major part of that. Uh, but I think just looking at the comments today, then looking at what the floodplain uh, committee came up with, you know, we started the moratorium issue. Um, and, uh, and they have very specific concerns, pro and con of what to do with such things as the proposal and the, the small building, which um, Neil has referred to, uh, not, not because of that application, but the concept of the application. And I think that's what we need to concentrate on is, you know, what do you want to move to? Because if you don't do that, you know, you, you can continue to have more of the same. You're going to have, you know, problems, um, and not, not that we can solve them all, but you're going to have more and more problems. And I all think right, so what do we what do we want to do, guys? Uh, I, I we put it off uh, for the regular meeting in, in two weeks. Is that uh, is that how it? Yeah, but I, I think I'd like to see Neil's you know a proposal from Neil going both ways. Um, is that a motion? I'm happy to make the motion. I, I don't think we need we can you know we can do it by consensus if you want whatever however you'd like to do it. Uh, Neil, is that is that something that will, that will you can do easily that won't won't overly complicate this? Because I, I mean, think uh, I think the easier the easy part will be well. I mean, if I'm using the same methodology, I think there's there's some fundamental questions that you know that every town that has this issue has to grapple with, which is what we're which the village is grappling with. Um, you know, do do you you know what what do you allow people to do? What are the incentives? Some places they bought out properties, and and so um, if we're still going with this methodology, I'm thinking the methodology for C1 and C2 is is fairly you know simple mathematical traffic studies in this, mm -hmm. um, but ultimately uh, I think I think the methodology for expanding it to the more expanded area, meaning the entire floodplain. Um, I, it'll be a little, I mean, it's, it's going to be a little bit more, uh, it's going to be more, um, you know, I think the questions that Dan poses, uh, Trustee Natchez poses were good ones. I just feel like it's, it, ha it would have to take a, 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 a different methodology than, than the limited area, possibly. Um, uh, I just need to, I needed, I would, I wouldn't be able to, basically, I wouldn't be able to give you a extended, the full on floodplain proposal, you know, in, in, in a few days, I need to really kind of think about that and uh, um, and and see how how that would work out. Unless you you wanted a similar methodology. Um, well, I'm I'm, I'm going to suggest that we uh, uh, that we um, deal with the C1 and C2 a moratorium proposal that that we have on our plates here. I'll put that on for two weeks, and then if we want to in the in the work session. Um, that uh, that same day, earlier that day, if we want to discuss uh, expanding it with the full board, then we can do that. Uh, but I don't think we should do it. I don't think the three of us should should expand it but now. It's just going to slow things down, and, uh, and we don't know what what the. Um... the Lou, that, that's one of the reasons I'm asking for two different proposals. We don't have a pro proposal yet for the C1, C2. Right. Neil is almost finished with uh, being able to provide. Right. Uh, he's heard a lot of comments. He may be able to come up with something in two weeks. And that that could help outline, you know, what <clears throat> whether we want to go on both courses or one course or no, no courses. I, that, I crystallize the discussion. All right, I, I, I hear it. I also, I, I'm also thinking that, um, I, I want to know, you know, what the status of the stu you know, the flood engineering studies that we asked for are. I mean, maybe, maybe we're. I don't know if it's. I don't know what the schedule is going to be. Whether we have to wait till we have this funding or whether we're going to start the RFP process. But there has also been that Neil may not know about. Um, there's going to be a substantial um, redo of. There's a repaving of Mamaroneck Avenue, and so the and the, and the county owns Mamaroneck Avenue, from. Um, White Plains to basically the railroad bridge. And yeah. so 
um, there are going to be some changes made to those intersections. And so there's mm -hmm. been studies done there. So that might be factored in. So it might be kind of three thoughts, like the C1, C2, and then the remaining part of the floodplain, but that the traffic studies would be one because it's kind of one area with one set of traffic signals. And some of it may already have been done because we've been doing these walking assessments and the county did some studies. So maybe we need to get that to Neil too. Yeah, I, I can talk to Neil separately about some of the uh, traffic items we're working on, the CDBG grants we've received. Uh, I did have a question. I don't want to belabor the point, but you know, part of the uh, item plan is the completion of the comprehensive plan. Do you want to treat that as a discrete item and move forward on that while we still wait for the second? Or yeah. Deal or? Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Dan. <laughs> okay. That'll be good to to get that yeah. checked off. That one we'll we'll put on for the the twenty fifth with the board's right. you know, consensus. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Now, as far as the zoning strategies, do you want to talk more about that or, or uh, another time? The third uh, uh, item on, under the... Yeah. Um, I, I think we have to wait. I'm, well, there's three of us here. I think we need to wait. Well, Victor's here. Victor is here. I see Victor. Victor is here? Yeah, I, but I mean, you know, it is something that, I mean, it's it's something Tom put on. I mean, obviously yeah. we're not gonna make a decision tonight. So I, uh, you know, it's a it's a big issue. If, if you know, if Neil has some, if he, if he wants to throw out some ideas we should have been thinking about for the next two weeks. Uh, well, I think, uh, well, I mean, there is a little bit of, uh, you know, overlap in terms of this moratorium study if, if in the future you're looking at infill housing or, if you're, you know, at least what came up when I was talking with the village manager and, and Mr. Sarnoff is the concept of a affordable housing overlay, um, which I believe is, is, is something that might have come for the trustees, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, you know, that has some, the, the, the work we do, clearly, you know, if you're, you know, whatever you, the infill housing overlay is, something that you know you could hypothetically see an overlay being placed on a certain properties or areas of the C1 or C2 where you might apply this this overlay uh, and you'll be coming against the question of development and floodplains through that means as well right. um, you know putting and that's that's a question but I think really I just wanted to find out uh, eventually it doesn't have to be now um, whether you're looking at a very specific, uh, a specific zoning strategy, this affordable housing overlay concept, um, or uh, are you looking at uh, kind of a more broader thing that includes zoning, but also other strategies uh, that are kind of programmatic uh, in terms of affordable housing? Um, and, and so that's that's just a general general question, uh, you which which for you to think about. I think there was an article that was on one of the agenda items associated with that, which had some uh, suggestions for what uh, other other things the village can do beyond zoning uh, to allow people to stay in affordable housing, and so the so the question is, um, you know, is there a need for a broader uh, a strategy, um, or is there uh, something, or is there is there commitment to focus on one or two specific zoning strategies and and try to move forward with those? Okay. Well, you have three different things here, That's right? Good. So uh, that, uh, I think with affordable housing, we need to look at everything. Um, right. right. The comprehensive plan certainly dovetails with that. Right, and so in the comprehensive plan, without a doubt, I think on a very uh, basic level uh, is a place where we can start to um, uh, just put into place certain uh, recommendations or certain things that the village should consider. Um, and so that that is a place, and that's why the land use and development section is gonna be one of the four areas that uh, we we focus on specifically, because I think there, there needs to be a little bit more teased out in the, in the write-up about affordable housing. I think there's more to be said in there and that could help, 
you know, uh, influence the, the way, the path that the village uh, would like to go. All right, so these, uh, these items will all uh, roll on for April 25th then, right? Yep. Okay, and, and we're not tinkering with them in any way. Now. Now, right. <laughs> okay, great. <Now. laughs> do, we need to, do we need to vote on that? No. Okay, all right, no. thank you. We're good, I think. I think my, as I mentioned, it's my second meeting I'm chairing since uh, high school. So this is a. Okay. <laughs> You've got a good team here. Huh? There's a good team here. <laughs> All right. Th thank you very much, uh, Neil. Appreciate it. Thanks. Thanks. Take care. Thanks, Neil. Okay. Uh, I see that uh, Mr. Sp I saw Mr. Spolzino was here. Oh, there yeah. he is. Yes. Yeah. So let's go back to the um, yeah. rental registration program. Sure. So I gave you a lot of material yeah. in your packet. Um, it was homework. There'll be a test um, when I'm finished. Yeah, thanks. Um, so what happened was we started doing research on this. And as you may recall, this is a law that um, Jerry essentially imported from the community in which he worked in New Jersey. So I knew there were laws like this, rental registration laws in New York. I thought it'd be a good idea to take a look at them. And I came across a couple which I've included in your package. And one of them, the Southampton law, which has been around for a while, um, has also been the subject of a legal challenge. So I thought maybe that would be the place to start rather than try to craft the law from what had been done in New Jersey to build on the law uh, from New York, the, the, the one that had been uh, withstood a challenge in New York and then add some of the elements of the New Jersey law that were not part of the, uh, the New York laws, like the, uh, the bond, when you have bad tenants, uh, the requirement that you take, a, uh, take action, the, land, the property owner or the landlord take action to stop whatever the offensive conduct is, those kinds of things. Uh, and so that's why I put it together this way, rather than head down a road you didn't want me to head down, um, bring it up for a discussion this way. Anybody have any comments on that? Um, can you sort of outline what the differences were in, you know, the substances that's different? Well, the... Um, and the two ideas that were in the New Jersey law that um, the New York law didn't have was one, the, the uh, specific landlord and tenant responsibilities. I didn't see that in this, the New York laws. And secondly, the bond where there has been an offensive conduct, repeated offensive conduct by the property. Those two concepts are not in the Southampton or uh, other New York laws. The New York laws are basically rental registration laws. Um, and they go into a number of, they go into a lot of detail about how the program would work that the New Jersey law does not. It's not as detailed about that. There are a couple of things that may or may not be of interest to you in the New York law, or at least in the Southampton law, one of which was duration, minimum duration of rentals. I don't know if you care. Uh, this was done before the concept of Airbnb. Uh, so I'm not sure how you want to approach that. Um, but the, uh, the uh, New York laws go into a whole lot of standards about how to define a property that is being used legally as a uh, dwelling unit for a family. That's what is a very complicated body of law on that. This one establishes indicia of what constitutes uh, multifamily occupancy of what should be a one family dwelling unit. Um, to my eye, it looks like it, it 
captures the complexity of the law on this subject. You know, it used to be, um, you know, there was a time 30 years ago or so when uh, the laws routinely said that a single family dwelling had to be uh, used by one or more persons related by blood or marriage. And that definition went out the window in a case out of Long Island, I think it was called Village of Beltaire against Boris 30, 35 years ago. And um, since then, laws have tended to talk about living as the functional equivalent of a family, which is an amorphous concept. This puts some meat on those bones. Um, it also deals with a lot of the uh, timing issues that I was struggling with, to be honest, on the New Jersey law. In terms of permits, you have to you have to get a permit before you rent. Can you rent before you get a permit? You have to register before you rent, or can you rent and then register? And if you register in the middle of the year, is your permit good for the rest of the year, or is it good just till December? Or does it go for a two-year period from when you register? Those sorts of things. And this was a I thought rather than my just come up with it on my own, this was a thought through system that's had some, that's been tested over years. So that's why I suggested this. And uh, I, I saw Jerry there, is, uh, he popped on or off. Uh, it, so you're, you're comfortable, you're comfortable with this, with the way it's structured, the, the way you've given it to us. So obviously you gave it to us. Uh, uh, Jerry, uh, any, any uh, feeling on it? Um. Lou, we have, a, um, we have a committee put together, an ad hoc committee put together. And what I could do is um, uh, I could discuss it with them so to give some time to go over the Southampton and the, um, what was the other one, Bob? Patterson? Patterson. Correct. Um, we can go over that and discuss it. We've been holding off on having another meeting until the Board of Trustees was presented with something from, uh, from Bob. Um, but in my opinion, um, having created that, that New Jersey um, structure, we really, the only thing I wanted to focus on as an elected official was to um, eliminate the hazards of <clears throat> over-occupancy and landlords that um, are not um, fixing up their, their properties, um, not having the proper um, electrical outlets near the water, uh, like in the bathroom or, or sink, uh, making sure that smoke detectors and carbon monoxide detectors are in the properties, make sure the handrails. It's basically, we used it as an annual CO to make sure that the people who are renting the property were safe and that they weren't being abused by their landlord in any way. And the rental registration, there's 5,500 rooftops in uh, where I used to work there's 1,800 rental properties, rental units. And so there's a lot of work. And what we did with the permit process was, it didn't matter when we renewed their, their permit, um, it would just, every week, it would trigger off a, a new series of uh, uh, renewals. So it didn't matter when someone registered. Um, a year later, we would no notify them and go reinspect the property to make sure everything was uh, above board. In fact, my property, because it's a rental property in New Jersey, is inspected annually. And they just make sure that everything's working properly. It takes 10 minutes for a, a three bedroom, two and a half bath house to make sure that everything looks uh, 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 and seems like it's in working order. And this is um, revenue neutral? Uh, the the, uh, the fees cover the... Uh, in the no. Uh-uh, no. Make money on it. Okay. Well, I like that. Revenue positive. Everything okay. I try to present is revenue mm -hmm. positive. But, I mean, how many staff members would it require? They have one 30-hour employee. He does 1,800 rental units a year. Right. But, so for us, that we have more than that, right? We probably have, I don't think double, Nora, but we probably have uh, one and a half. So maybe uh, 2,500 or so uh, <coughs> rental units. So we'll need a full-time employee to do that. So just so you're aware, the law in New York may be different than the law in New Jersey on this subject. Um, in New York, you can't require an, an inspection 
as a condition of registration. I don't know what the situation is in New Jersey. Uh, the only way you can do, there are only two ways you can, you can inspect the interior. And as I mentioned in my memo, this may have been the distinction that the building department was operating under when it said that they only inspect the common areas. You can always inspect areas that are open to the public within a building. But when you get to private areas like apartments, you can only inspect either with the consent of the occupant or with a search warrant. And we had a search warrant, you have to have probable cause. We established the consent of the occupant and the landlord. We would go through the property. They would be scheduled appointments. And this individual would have scheduled appointments and both the landlord and the tenant would go through the property and make sure. Um, so these, these are, I don't understand. These are, not, these are not, I mean, are the, are the inspections required or not? If they're required, uh, how can they be option? I don't know. I mean, uh, well, there's a, there's a Fourth Amendment interest here. Pride Fourth Amendment uh, right to be free of unreasonable searches and seizures mm -hmm. uh, element to this. And so they, they can't be required as part as a condition of getting a permit to rent. So we could do we could en enact this law and not be in any different situation than we're in now. Right. Yeah. Although Jerry's saying that people did consent. So maybe they did. You know, people because they wanted consent. They use it as a they use it as a, a um, as a tool to demonstrate to the tenant that the property has been inspected and it's in good shape. I use it I use it in my case as well. My tenant wants to know how the inspection. In fact, I think Bob, if you saw that, the laws require that I have to give my tenant a copy of the approval cert or this the certificate so that they have it. Uh, they can't just send it to me because I'm paying the bill. They have to have a copy of the certificate. But if you didn't, if you didn't consent, could you still rent your house out? Yeah, I could. Yeah. But I would be in violation. No, I mean, but that's what, what, what Bob is saying is we can't require people to consent. So we can't right. put people in violation if we can't require them to consent. Right. Well, you know, so I mean, I that's, know. that's the difference. If that's, if that's a difference, it, it may be that we, um, that we don't do something like this, but uh, I know for a fact, and I can tell you stories, and I'm sure others, especially the fire department and police department can tell you stories about some of the properties and the condition that they're in. And that's where the concern is. Unless we go there because someone's injured or it, there was a fire, um, we don't know that the property is you know, oh. in deplorable condition. No, I, I understand. It's just that if we, if we can't require people to do inspections, it seems like this isn't going to be our solution. Where, where, where are the teeth in, in it? I mean, how, can you, can, how can you compel uh, compliance? Well, we didn't have a problem, but what ended up happening was the public was aware that they needed to register their rental and they needed to be inspected. And so it just, it just grew from there. As far as people, you know, working around the law. I know we have a couple of experts around here, but the truth is, you know, a lot of people will want to make sure that their property, if I'm renting an apartment, I want to make sure my property is, is uh, in good shape. So you, you think here. this is a good idea? I know it's a good idea. The problem is if it can, if it flies, I know it's a good idea. I just don't know if it flies. That's why I handed it off to Bob and Mark. For their, you know, interpretation of it. What was the challenge in Southampton, Bob? You can't tell me what to do with my property. Yeah, yeah. There, were, there were a whole lot of challenges to it. Yeah. But the basic, the big challenge was, you can't make me register my property. You can't tell me what to do. And that was defeated. Yes. So oh. people have to register their property, but they don't have to have their property inspected. Correct. Well, I wasn't just looking for a, a revenue generator, although I do that all day long. I was looking for, you know, the ability to make sure we inspect properties because but we the, don't know. Uh, we, don't, we don't know who has who has illegal uh, oh, apartments, who has divided up apartments. We just don't know. You don't I, have ESP, right? 
You no, know I don't know. We don't know. Of course no, not. No, right. right. Um, so what what does our code one twenty six eleven do? It's it's for dormitories and for public spaces, but it's it's that's right. And multiple dwellings, but that's not right. three or more. So we can now inspect properties with three or more, whether they're registered. I don't think you can. Okay. No, oh, I, mean, so we, I shouldn't say that. I think the same first Fourth Amendment restriction applies to those. Okay. Just because we passed a law doesn't mean we should have. You don't. You don't. You can supersede a lot of things, mm -hmm. but you can't supersede the Fourth Amendment. What? What's the um? What's the penalty for not registering? Uh, I forget what it was in Jersey. I could look um, it up. No, I mean, I mean, what would it be for us? Uh, uh, do we have any means of enforce? I mean, it just seems like if it's so, if it's an unenforceable law, what you know, I don't know. So we have this standard penalty that we use, which is two hundred and fifty dollars a day. Right. We we have that in a lot of different areas, uh, a lot of different sections of the code. So let's use that as an example. You know, if you uh, if you don't register, the penalty would be two hundred and fifty dollars, and each day constitutes a, a a new penalty. I don't know. That sounds pretty aggressive, but I'm okay with collecting penalties too, not just fees. Jerry, what's what's our local court done with that in terms of enforcing that? Um, they're fifty fifty split from the days that I've been in court. Sometimes they um, sometimes they excuse it. And sometimes they make a deal. So for instance, I had a individual who had a sidewalk cafe out for 20 days. So I was looking for the full 20 times 250 and ended up that we settled, you know, the court asked the village to consider. We settled at a thousand dollar fine for putting out, you know. So I want to be heavy handed, but we have judges who are, um, um, you know, very considerate. And, and they work in this community. They have to live in this community too. I get it. I get it. All right. Um, you put this on for the uh, for meeting in two weeks. If you think if you think there's some value to it, um, but you know, if you're not gonna if we're not gonna be able to so enforce. Well, I'm asking the the the. Uh, the, if we, the board. If we can't require inspections, it seems like there's minimal use. But is Jerry, do you think it's something that's worth running by your committee? I can. I mean, do you think I have to. It? I have to be. I have to be honest with them and tell yeah. them, look, you know, this is what we have. I mean, I wouldn't want to get rid of it uh, because uh, uh, I think we could make. I think we could do some good things with the fees that we collect, but. You know, the reality is if we can't get into properties to make sure people are safe, that's really the objective that I want to I want to achieve. So I'll talk to them. We'll, we'll call I'll call a meeting together if you guys want me to. You know, I recommend we we pull it off the agenda, let the committee meet and then um, put it back on and, and see uh, if they want us to put it back on. If not, then it was just an idea. And Victor, what do you think? I think that's why we have this committee, right? I mean, yeah. we've got a bunch of stakeholders. Okay. And not every idea turns out to be practical. No, the committee may want alternate solutions because they do see a concern and a problem. Yeah. Um, I, they may I, want alternate solutions, but what was it, Bob? What's the uh, what's holding me back from going to do inspections? Title what? The Fourth Amendment. Oh, the Fourth Amendment. Oh, just a little thing called the Fourth Amendment. <laughs> so, yeah, right. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, that's that's our thing. You know, I want to make sure people are safe. But um, if I can't do that, you know. That's um, um, all, all right. Let's. Uh, why don't you take it back to the committee and then uh, and, and let us know. All right. Thank you. I, I don't want to. I'm hoping we're moving along uh, quick enough. I've been asked to take a couple of things out of order. Um, can we take uh, something out of new business before we finish up old business, or is that permitted? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Did you okay. finish? You finished old business? Okay, good. No. no, we didn't finish old business. No, we didn't. No, no, I'm talking about the uh, on for the 25th meeting. Which one? 
There's a bunch of items on old business on for the 25th meeting. Target on for the 25th. Most of them. Got to make sure that we discuss them today at the on the 11th so that we can put them on the. All right. Yeah. Well, yeah. Let's let's get let's get through that. All right. Um. Let's skip down to um, J. Uh, referral to Planning Board Wireless Edge application for recertification of special use permit, Fenimore Road cell tower. Dan, thirty seconds. Dan, no sure. more than that. Uh, the uh, the owner or the operator of the site <clears throat> renew their permit. Uh, technically, the code says the uh, uh, responsible board approves it, and that would be the village court or the village property. But the planning board typically handles applications of this type. They just did one. For a site at 1600, also the, uh, 1600 Harrison Avenue. So I'm recommending that the board refer this to them, let them do the uh, review and make a recommendation back to the village board. And what is the fees that we get for this? Uh, I I can get that back to you tomorrow. I don't have the fees and charges schedule. Are you talking about the fees that we get annually for the, uh, the site? No, did, on this specific, there's a renewal request yeah. to, for a renewal. For renewal, right. specific, for a specific I'll get that to you tomorrow, Dan. Yeah, I recall it was substantial, but all right. Um, okay. Uh, well, the, the planning board meets this week and in two weeks. So if we don't refer it tonight, they wouldn't do it for four weeks. Yeah, and, and I did, it, right? Yeah, and I, I spoke to Kathy, uh, the chair of the planning board, to say this is uh, this came in. I'm going to ask the board to refer it to you, and her response was. We just did this for this place. We should not do it. So, okay. All right. Honorable so we'll, and parade. Uh, we'll put that on for the twenty fifth then. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, K. Uh, Fireman's Carnival and Parade. Yeah. What about that? Just dates. That's... It's carnival. It's carnival dates and parade. It's just a standard. We do this every year. Oh, Maybe we, we didn't do it once during COVID, but I don't remember when COVID was already. So uh, it's just an annual resolution. All right. Yes, on for 25th. Got it. Yep. All right, let's, let's, let's say we'll, that's on for the 25th then. Um, our, uh, next is L. Arcata's proposal to Ray's Village owned manhole in New York Thruway Authority Yard located. Do we have on... a manhole? Lou, we have a manhole in the New York State. The New York Thruway Authority Yard, located at, on Mamaroneck Avenue, yeah, right at the um, entrance between the, I'm sorry, the yeah, the entrance and and 95, the entrance yeah. to 95 and 95, um, it needs to be raised because they're using it as a um, a storage lot for soil, and there's um, infiltration of soil into our system, so it needs to be raised. Arcadis' proposal is to uh, do the engineering and make sure the project gets done properly. The Thruway Authority will pay for the construction. Excellent. And, and, and we're talking about simply, you know, like a, like a tube around it, right? 32 foot increase. Okay. All right. But we're responsible for the engineering fees. They've asked us to, um, they've asked us to hire our engineer and pay for the engineering fees. Um, and that's the split that they uh, discussed. I, I, understand, I understand, but I, and I am in favor of our engineer making sure it's done right and coming up with the specs, et cetera. Uh, but I believe, you know, there were a violation of our local law by filling, you know, and you can, and uh, that's also part in the floodplain. Uh, you know, so it's, there, there are issues on, on more than one of our laws. Uh, they should be paying for the whole thing. Well, there's a 250 a day, Jerry. Good yep. luck with that, huh? <laughs> no, I, you know, it, 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 I, I understand. <clears throat> I think, so, so I agree with Dan. I don't disagree with Dan. I think the reality is if we don't come up with a cost sharing uh, agreement on this, it won't get done. They don't care. And we do. Mm -hmm. And then I have to um, do it the hard way with the state. And you know I'm not going to get anywhere, so right. that's the problem. We know what the amount is. I'm. I'm it's. Or is it? Is this the? It, are, I, we just have hourly rates. We don't have. Yeah. Um. I'm just looking at that. And Dan, Dan, can you look? 
Were you in front of your computer? Can you look to see if there was a total? Because, I mean, I'm in front of my computer, but I thought that was in previous uh, work sessions. I, I, there was never, I don't think there was ever a total. Yeah, I mean, I, so they, they say, they estimated about two weeks to do the work. Uh, let's see. I know, but the salaries go from seventy-one dollars an hour to two sixty-six an hour. So yeah. How about how about we talk about a uh, a not to exceed number that the board is comfortable with, or if it's just zero, then then it's zero. I go back to them and say, yeah. you know, so so if we if we run a, a do not exceed number, then mm -hmm. I can say, look, I only got this amount of money from the board to be able to do this, and then I can sit down with the. Um, with the bosses, the foreman at the uh, at the throughway authority, and try to uh, try to renegotiate. What's Jerry, a good number? What, what, what if I may? Um, how about uh, calculating what the cost would, uh, what the fines would be for violating our various laws, and saying we're willing to waive all that. You just pay for the whole thing. Okay, I'll do that. Or failing that. Let's give you some wiggle room. Let's take the median salary and multiply it by 80 hours. 80 hours, like one, 132 by 80. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, uh, it, come, it comes out to about 12 grand, right? Yep. yep. I bet that's more than the fees than our fines. I don't know how many days, right? Depends on how many days. Well, I, gotta, I, gotta, I gotta see when I was notified. Mm -hmm. I was notified when we were doing inspections of the, uh, we were doing inspections of the uh, of the property. Yeah, my, my general experience is that the, you know, they'll have a staff engineer or a senior engineer do the majority of the of the design work, and then the principal engineer will review it to make sure all the numbers add up and sign off on it. Yeah, but Nor Nora's Nora's yeah. calculation is is probably yeah. going to be spot on, easily. Um, so what we were doing, is, is many of you know, we had we had 22 manholes missing or unaccounted for um, when we started uh, in um, March of last year uh, working with Save the Sound. I think it was 22. Bob Bob might remember more. Um, and so we were looking for manholes, and that's when we found this one. So that would be the date, uh, and I could probably tell you. Uh, if I look up the sewer foreman's it, missing manholes, I mean, oh yeah, unaccounted yeah. for. We couldn't find them, Lou. You're not talking about the covers. You're talking about the actual the actual hole. No, I'm talking about the covers. I'm talking about the manholes that we couldn't find that were either paved over in driveways oh, or backyards. You know, grassed over backyards. You know, that kind of stuff. Got it. Um. All right. Um. Yeah, we're going back to. You have enough for us from that? Yeah, we're going back to. Um, let me see. We started looking for manholes March 2nd, 2021. All right. So that's a pretty so, good find. So you, 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 you have enough to take care of this then, right, Jerry? I do. Okay, when great. Get, so, when you get a call from the state, just, tell, just forward it to me. We'll do. Take care All of right. It. So we're moving on to new business now. Um, well, I want to uh, start with. Uh, Danielle's been here patiently waiting. Uh, we're going to take her out of order. Uh, 2H employee handbook. Oh. Okay, great. Thank sorry you. For the, sorry for the wait. Yeah, no problem. No problem. Um, so I presented a, a draft handbook um, when I when I when I was asked to start the HR department uh, a, a few years ago. That was mm -hmm. one of the items that was requested of me to um, to look in doing a handbook. There were a couple of different versions that kind of floated around uh, internally here, um, but I, I asked for the help of an HR consultant company, uh, GTM uh, Pinnacle HR, to help draft a, a handbook for us. Um, and it, it followed the guidelines of the state about the policies that we should have, which we do have, but the way our policies are, they're kind of loose. They're not in a formalized book. Um, I've made every effort to, when a new person comes on board, they get a copy of all the policies. They're loose documents. They're not 
in a, a book per se. They're in a folder. Lou, Lou can attest to that. I remember um, that. Yes. Yes. Um, but prior to me, I'm 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 just a little concerned about how our long-term employees have those policies and what type of updates. So the the handbook would put everything in one place. There will be a quick reference so that that if an employee does have a question, they would be able to refer to the table of contents to see if they can get the answers that they need. Um, nothing is really changing because we're following the things that are in this particular handbook, but it's just in a more formalized fashion. Um, and we're not changing the language. Um, the handbook, uh, there is some sign-offs and acknowledgements that keeps the employee um, responsible for what they're being presented with. Um, I'm not sure what was done in the past and this will hold people more accountable. And it does not take away from our current uh, collective bargaining agreement. This would just work in conjunction with that. So the handbook would just represent what everyone needs to follow, but there are references throughout the handbook saying, if there's a particular item like a vacation time, uh, a person would need to refer to the, their prospective collective bargaining agreement. Uh, we have right. two, we have two, uh, we have two unions uh, that are in play right now, and we do have a number of non-union employees. Our non-union employees do follow the guidelines of one of the collective bargaining agreements, which is the CSCA. Um, so any non-represented person does get a copy of the CSCA agreement so that, that they can follow those guidelines. Um, this handbook has, has a, about 14 sections. Um, which also references general policies, which I distribute. It referenced training that I've stay on top of. It referenced employment uh, policies, uh, which is also important. So they understand the difference between the different classes of employees. So it's just a quick reference versus uh, coming to my office if they can get the answer a, a little more readily with that. Um, it also references compensation and how that's done and paid time off. Um, so this document is really meant to, to cover and protect the village, uh, saying that we are in compliance with what we're supposed to communicate to our employees, and in turn, the employee is signing off on that they did receive this document. Um, so my goal is to, um, to have this distributed to all of our employees, whether via a hard copy or an electronic copy. Our new employees would have it moving forward. And it's a document that can be updated by GTM when there's a new policy update, uh, which does happen frequently. They'll let us know, and then that can be um, converted into this the newer handbook so that it's, it's distributed properly. Um, Who's GTM? It's a uh, it's it's a HR and payroll consultant company that we hired in December of last year, um, and the purpose of that company is that. When I started the HR department, um, I everything was kind of in different locations in different departments. So I did my best to kind of uh, streamline everything. And I'm on top of all of the compliance items that we're supposed to have, whether it's OSHA or PASH or mandatory trainings or other like EEO uh, requirements that I'm supposed to do. But I do feel that there are other things that I might not be looking at you take for granted when you work in HR your whole career, you take for granted the items that every HR department has. When you have to start a new department from scratch, you're not quite sure what you might be missing. So GTM is helping me uh, bridge that gap to make sure that I, I am compliant with everything that I'm doing, including putting in uh, new processes and new policies uh, to help kind of streamline things for the whole village, honestly. Thank you. What do, uh, what do we need to do with this now? Um, I mean, I did, just, it was kind of posted. I just wanted everyone just to have an idea of, mm -hmm. of what I wanted to do because it was something that was asked of me that they wanted a handbook. So mm -hmm. I wanted everyone to see what this consulting company was able to come up with. It, it is a lot of information, um, but I'd rather inundate people with information so it's there. Uh, and is at their disposal. Um, and I guess I kind of turn it over to Dan or Jerry as to if this is something that the board has to approve or not. 
Jerry, are you happy with this? I am. It's a policy. That's why it's in front of the board. So we, I mean, we, I guess we have to adopt it as a policy. It's gonna, if it's going to be effective, we have to adopt it as a policy. I, I mean, I think it's, you know, a no-brainer, right? Yeah. yeah. All right. All in favor of adopting a uh, employee handbook to be disseminated to all oh. new employees? I move. I second as long as we don't, do we have to say specific draft or can we just say this handbook? Because it's going to get revised. <clears throat> uh, what I think would be better if we can is that we, you know, the board adopts the policy that we have an employee handbook that is distributed to everybody, uh, all employees, and that they uh, acknowledge receipt. Yeah. All right. So I, I move that uh, we adopt the policy of, the, of their Pardon? being an employee handbook that is given to every new employee. Are you are you moving this to be adopted or to move to the regular meeting agenda? Oh, you're right. Um, I don't uh, know it's on, it's a, it's on for next week. I think what we did is ask for a resolution as a policy, uh, as a broad policy, as opposed to this specific handbook. That way, Danielle can amend it and doesn't have to come back to us. All right. So we vote on it here. Now, can we can we do that? No, we just refer to the uh, to Bob to draft or to Dan to draft a resolution to that effect. Okay. For the next for the next meeting. All right. I'm glad everybody's keeping an eye on me. I appreciate it. Danielle, will you post this online or is it just internal? Um, I would prefer it to be on in, internal because we don't have an intranet. Um, where okay. it would just be to the employees. We only have the, the internet and, you know. Okay. Thank you. All right, the other um, item that we've been taking out of order is replacement of the street sweeper. And we have James Barney standing by. Do we have Chief Barney? Yeah, I am here. There he is. Oh. Yeah, we can hear you. There you go. Now we can see you. Sorry about that. Um, we're uh, we're requesting that we can um, add the street sweeper uh, to the to the agenda. Um, we we were supposed to replace it, I believe, uh, next um, next capital budget item if it was to be approved. Yep. Um, the street sweeper, as you know, is a pretty sensitive. Uh, tool in this village. It's also a pretty sensitive subject, um, but the the spare, the, what we consider the the backup or spare street sweeper, um, has it, its parts are are impossible to get. Um, it's it's not as maneuverable as the the newer machine, and while it is still of some value, we think it would be best to replace that sweeper. And the current frontline sweeper would still have some life left to be our backup sweeper. Mm -hmm. um, right now, where we're at, the the frontline sweeper that we're using um, is is was running non nonstop during Ida. It was it was taking a, a beating. Obviously, everybody saw that. It, it ran for the month of September. It, it was running twelve hour days for four weeks. Um, just that one machine and, and not a single breakdown. Um, and now we're seeing, now we're seeing the effects of that. It's we've, the sweeper season has been open for two weeks and that, that machine has actually been down and we've been using the backup sweeper. And now we're reliving all those problems with the backup sweeper that we were, you know, blessed to not have to deal with. So, um, and we think it would be very beneficial to, to get that machine replaced. And, um, you know, I, I have posted the, the uh, posted the, the quote from Long Island Sanitation. It is, um, <clears throat> it is uh, on the source well contract. So multiple bids are not needed. Um, it's also the exact, it would be the new version of the machine that we're currently using. Um, and the mechanics love working on it. It's an e ease of, Ease of use while driving it, ease of use while repairing it. Um, we think that we just we, we think this is the right way to go. 
And we know it's a year earlier than it would have been planned um, as far as the capital budget, but I don't think we can afford to wait. So Chief, I, I, need, to, I need to interject here. When Tony and I worked on uh, the capital budget um, in its original version, we had it in the 21-22 um, capital <coughs> budget. So it's, it's for June. Um, it's the replacement of a 14-year-old. Now it's a 16-year-old sweeper, I would assume. That's correct. Right? 16-year-old. Um, and the useful life is typically 12 years and four to five years in, in support capacity. So it's right there in that replacement. What was the lead time? Because I have here 10 to 12 um, months is what Tony anticipated. When yeah, so there he's telling me between uh, eight, eight to twelve. Okay, so it's it's really the same thing. You're only two months two months uh, ahead of schedule. That's really what you are. Do we pay for it now, or do we? No, you pay for it when you get it delivered. Right. So it's it really doesn't make that much of a difference, right? Whether right. we. Yeah, the, the resolution will be written that it's going to be application of fund balance or future future issues of debt and. Augie is gonna, if we go out to debt, Augie will put it all in, you know, a common issue. Yep. Uh, this, I get, mm -hmm. I, this is, I mean, I, I'm, I'm all for this, but I'm just asking Jerry a FEMA question. Um, so is the fact that our current streets, the, the new, how old, how old is the new one, James? Uh, the new one is a third, no. It, a, it was delivered in 2016, I think. 2016, yeah. So our new one, was damaged by Ida or by the use well, in Ida. No, it's it, no. it's it's not that it was it was damaged by it. It's just that it the the wear and tear we what we put it through, we, you, you probably took three years, four years off its lifespan. So I mean it's not it's it's still functional. I mean I mean it's it's being repaired right now because common things that need to be replaced on it. Um, but it's not it's not broken per se no i just meant does jerry get to factor that into his magic fema well, what they let me do nora is they let me factor in the use the four week or five week use of the street sweeper okay. so that's, yeah, and, okay. and they get me and they they give us a, a an hourly rate for that so that'll amount to a significant amount right um i mean we need to do this i'm just yeah. i'm i'm just sort yeah. of fascinated by how you guys have been you know managing these emergencies so which becomes the backup? That's what I'm confused on. What I'm hearing is we have two sweepers that Frontline have- Frontline one now, Dan. Frontline what? one now. One, yeah, one, the one they're using as, as the main one now becomes the backup. Yeah. The 20 so hiring the backup. We're going to the support capacity. Yeah, but okay, but- For auction. Okay, but I'm, I'm sort of confused because I'm hearing that both have problems that the present backup has less hours uh, and I gathered or intimated maybe less problems than the current one that is their frontline one. Um, I just don't know which makes more sense to have as a backup or not, but. So the, the current backup, the older of the two machines um, from just in the, in the 15 years that I've been here, it's got, it's always had constant issues. So that's, okay. that's, that's the first thing. Um, it's, it's very difficult to work on. And now because of its age, it's very difficult to get parts for yeah. extremely difficult to get parts for. Whereas what I understand is that the, with, the, the, uh, the, the parts are compatible with the two, the two units we have, you can get parts for both right. of them. Interchangeable. Right. Okay. Yep. Absolutely. So, so Nora, uh, just, I just looked up, um, the um, the rate um, uh, 240 hours is what we use the sweeper uh, during the during the cleanup period and um, uh, we get 232 dollars per hour so it's 55 thousand dollars that we get from FEMA for the use of our sweeper so that covers that covers a lot of sins right there and you ha and with having um, having a slightly newer backup than you normally would have and it's only yeah. slightly newer it's a few months you can you you know you, you don't have to say well we're only using this truck you can it's up to it's up to you guys to figure out how to balance the use of it right Just and that that's essentially what happened is we we always they actually used to alternate the machines 
um, as, as they were using them, regardless of the backup. Mm-hmm. But once, once we kept having constant issues with, with this older machine, it just didn't get used unless it was absolutely necessary because we knew that it was gonna, there was going to be a breakdown. Who wants to drive the clunker, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> right. So this is on for the regular meeting, right? Mm-hmm. Okay, what's next? Yeah. Okay. Flood Mitigation Advisory Committee. Is the uh, chair here? I think that got postponed um, for two weeks. Got it. Okay. All right. Um, I think there are a couple other items which we would like to have on the 25th, which would be uh, funding requests for Fenimore Road Prospect Avenue intersection. Yeah. Um, this is something uh, I think the um, uh, the engineer, our traffic engineer, estimated it just around uh, ninety thousand dollars for this to go out to bid. To bid, we decided to break it up. Um, we have uh, Public Works doing the striping and the signage. We have Parks doing the planting, and then we've been soliciting quotes for the construction, the actual uh, uh, concrete work, and uh, uh, associated uh, hardscape construction. So um, we have a, a total request for funding, um, which includes value engineering, which is a nice term for our guys are gonna help do this. All right. There, I have, there was, a, a, isn't there like a ton, I, I, I'm trying to look at this. I looked at it the other day. There were a lot of plants. Was that the right number? It was like a huge- No, there's, Nora, there's way too many plants. It's yeah. it's. It's ridiculous. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. They packed them in. You could keep the Girl Scouts busy doing yeah. volunteer work. They don't work. realize they don't realize spacing in, in that small area. So right. we, we'll we'll wipe that out. We'll 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 redesign it. Plus, we're going to use pollinator um, um, plants uh-huh. and uh, and some other uh, low maintenance stuff. And it went out for bidding, right? It did go out for bidding for so the received, for the construction. Uh, solicited three quotes. Mm-hmm. And the low quote is from Peter J. Landy Incorporated. Uh, they're the firm that's going to be doing the work on Waverly Avenue and East Prospect Avenue. Uh, they're doing uh, sidewalk work in the town of Maranek. They've done work for us in the past. Uh, you know, they come uh, uh, well recommended, and uh, I think they clearly understand the scope of the work. Because we broke it up, because we broke it up, we're well below the threshold, so we didn't have to write bid specifications and put it out to bid. All right. Okay. I mean, is that, it saves, I guess, does it save money to do it that way too? Well, yeah, compared to the quotes that we got, it saves a lot of money. Plus, plus our, our, our employees are willing to, to know, do it. To yeah. do plus, it. You know, the we have product. the equipment, we have the knowledge. So. Can we, have, Jerry, can you work up what the, what the relative costs are so we can demonstrate that for others? Yeah, sure. You mean as far as what we're doing? Yeah, you know, what we're doing in house. Yeah. Okay. We'll get you. Be with the but, you know, and if we, you know, if we're doing it overtime, including the overtime, and you know what the full cost would be. Okay. So there's a comparison of both. Okay. A comparison. So we didn't bid out the whole job, Dan. We no, just no, bid I out the construction. Okay. But but you have estimates from similar work that you. I have bid. estimates from the engineer. Yes, that's correct. Yep. So we'll we'll we'll. We'll um, show you our comparison compared to um, what the engineer. You'll have that for the twenty fifth. Yeah, yeah. We said we're Thank you. Sixty two thousand. The pro- the public works portion, the public works project, which would be the work Randy's doing, is around twenty thousand, and the other would account for uh, the materials, the overtime for both for DPW parks and uh, police if necessary. Uh, I, I understand that, but if you you add it all together, and then you know you have. Oh, yeah that you can compare uh it, it gives a it's not gonna i'm not looking for a dollar to dollar comparison but i'm looking for you know it's saving approximately x dollars versus y dollars that's our sure. big, you know i think it's you know a good a good way to manage it i agree okay so that's all for the 25th then um next uh, the um mas pta wants to serve alcohol at parents night out on may 20th they're renting the deck. They have approximately 50 people. Uh, it's a PTA, you know, no kids uh, invited type of event. I guess it's mostly um, 
uh, billed as a fundraiser for the PTA. So they want to have um, they want to have alcohol uh, on that evening. Um, it's May 20th, so it's off season. Um, we all know that uh, May is still, you know, guessing on what the weather is, but uh, that's what they're asking the board, and this is the process. And the, they they ran it by the Parks and Rec Commission or Rec and Parks, and the go. Rec and Parks thought it was a good idea. They, I guess there have been other um, fundraisers from both the school districts there with great success mm -hmm. and good behavior. Yep. Any objections in them? All right, we'll put that up. Um, we don't, we did put that on for the regular meeting then, right? Yep. For the 25th. Yeah, we just want to move it forward. Yep. Okay. All right. Uh, next, uh, installation of glass, steel and glass bulletproof door at the um, rundown police department we have. Um, um, they want to. Uh, they want a bulletproof door. Uh, the police department uh, received a grant to implement improved security improvements, which included the access control system and the. Uh, a bulletproof uh, door, uh, and uh, the board are previously authorized the purchase and installation of the access control system. There's about $8,500 left in that grant. Uh, the chief received quotes. Uh, I think the low quote was $8,800. So she's proposing to use the remainder of that, okay. and a couple hundred dollars from the uh, contractual services line. And, and this is compatible with the with the work we're doing over there? Yes. Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, that's on for the 25th then. Any any issues from anybody? No. Yeah. Right. Fine with me. Maybe so so I apologize for coming in late. I was in the city, but what did we talk? Did we talk about old business N as in Nancy? No. No, we did not. Was no. there a presentation for this evening? No. They okay. did that was last week. It was two weeks ago. Well, no. Yeah, I think we're, we're asked, I think we still look, we're asked to coordinate that with the. Uh, yeah. Yeah. We, asked, we haven't, we haven't, we haven't, uh, that's not we solid yet, a, right? Then? Yeah. We haven't had a discussion of that at the board, you know, at the board. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. And there's nobody waiting to talk to us. No, talked, right. I mean, we talked a little bit about it two weeks ago with um, some CFTE members. Mm -hmm. And should the NYSERDA presentation be at a regular board meeting or at a work session meeting? Yeah, it should be at a regular board meeting. Hold on. I would think, yeah, regular board meeting. Let me see here. Uh, Dan, are we, Dan, we're meeting with Kat, Carol, yeah, sometime that's next week. All right, about the, uh, Item uh, 2J. No, I'm talking about item 1N. Oh, yeah, that's, uh, I think we're trying to set something up. I, I don't, I, let me see if I can find it in my uh, calendar. My recollection was that we asked uh, staff to meet with them. Yep, we set it up. Let me get the date. Yeah. This Wednesday, 10 o'clock or 1030. 1030. 10. 1030 and it is this Wednesday. We're meeting with the Clean Energy Communities Coordinator, Kat yeah. Carroll, yeah. K-A-T. Yeah. So we'll have more on that next next time. I'm sorry. I just wanted to All make right. sure we didn't skip. I didn't I didn't miss something. So uh, go ahead, Grab. I think we finished the what had to be on for you know that to be moved right. for the twenty. So you need to go back, I think, to the regular you know to the agenda items. Um, so the uh, oh yeah, here we go. The um, expanded Florence Street stormwater investigation and study uh, to be held. That's to be held on April twenty April twenty fifth. Never mind. Um, I think we're caught up here. No, we have to go back to one um, F. Well, we have to go. Have back. Info on ah, right. Thank you, Laura. You're welcome. That's okay. <laughs> but um, we're making progress. 
<laughs> one F transfer station roof project and solar panels at 310 and 313 Fayette Avenue. So I just I just received um, late last week uh, information. I think Friday actually um, from our um, engineer and uh, the uh, firm that we were um, working with on the transfer station. Um, they uh, do not have a price increase to design the transfer station roof with solar panels. So that'll be in the design. Um, they said that they would, um, they, they said that, um, so, so what I have to do for the board um, when Trustee Natchez asked is do a comparison of uh, the first time, I believe we received the quotes um, for, the, uh, for the engineering and, and architectural work and this, this, and what the difference was. So I'll do that for the next meeting. I'll make and sure this, that, um, that. And the power we generate here would go where? Uh, right, well, we, we would connect it to, we have to, we will either use it locally right in our buildings or connect it to a grid. I think that's great. Uh, that's that's great news. All right. Are we caught up, Jenna Laura? No. no we got to go to the next one is G. After, after G oh, it's social media policy. Yes. So I, I put this on, and it's been on for a while. And um, it, actually, the reason I put it on, it's sort of I'm glad Danielle was here. Jerry and I, early in the pandemic decided that we should have a, um, a handbook for board and commission members, which I've drafted a couple times and I've worked with Courtney on it. And what, and the last sticking point is the social media policy. Um, so we can explain to volunteer board and commission members how, you know, what the, what the social media policy is. And so basically our village policy is we push stuff out. We don't take comments so that we don't have to worry about them being, you know, like public records and stuff. Um, and, yep. and I think that we have a policy that was adopted in 2015, which I really think should be revised. And I think we should have like a subcommittee of people doing it. This doesn't have to be on the agenda, you know, every week, we just need to sort of get it done. I think one of the things I'm concerned about in looking this up is that um, comments that we make on social media if they relate to village business could be construed to be, and this is a, a Bob question, um, could be construed to be like a public comment or a public record. And how do we maintain those things? If we're talking about, and even if it's on our own social media accounts, if we're talking about village business, is that something that has to get captured? So I think we have a very good system for how the village pushes stuff out, but I think we have to figure out how to be mindful and give guidance to our volunteers about what they can do. And so I included a couple of documents that I got. And the most useful one I think is, um, well, it's page 209 or eight of, of my PDF, but it's the one from New York State Office of Technology Services. Yep. And um, on page five of that, um, it gives some guidance um, about when you're speaking on behalf of the state, which obviously we're not, we're not working on behalf of the state, but also about how state employees should be mindful about um, what they're saying. And that's on page two of the next document, it could become public record. So I'm just putting that out there to think about. I don't have any answers. I, um, I'm gonna try to, I've tried to cobble something together that I'll send to Bob so we could just get the handbook out there even in the short term because people have been asking questions. But um, I think it's just something for us to think about and maybe we should have a, a couple of people who are thinking about it. Now, is this, is this a social media policy you want to put in the handbook? Uh, well, you know, yeah. I mean, I think, well, there is, we have a social media policy. We can just append that to the handbook and it talks about pushing out. But um, like, there's a requirement. I mean, I think when when the village, you know, that when the village is posting, it's a village employee who's posting. They know what the rules are. I always just want to make sure that all of the volunteers understand what 
what construes a, a public record. So I, you know, <coughs> I don't want to hamstring anybody, but I also don't want, um, you know, we all know we shouldn't be posting stuff that's confidential. We shouldn't be posting stuff that's, you know, subject of a lawsuit. Um, but um, when we're posting stuff on our own personal social media, we have to be careful whether it's, you know, <coughs> advertising, you know, an arts council something and somebody complains about it or whether it's, um, you know, talking about some other kind of village business. So I'm just putting it out there for, I think it's a conversation we have to have and I think we should figure out who should be having that conversation to report back. Okay, uh, uh, let, let's let's talk about it then. All right. I mean, not now, but so it's so it's it's on the National Cities uh, National League of Cities. It's bottom of page two, top of page three, uh, maybe all of page three. That's what you're talking about. Yep. That kind of stuff. Okay. So, and I just, you know, I think it's something we need to, you know, it's social media is something that everybody uses to some extent or another. And I just, I feel it's something that we need to be on top of. But you're okay. You're okay with, with what our PI, uh, Robert and I do because oh, we, yeah. I mean, I we, think we clear and debate. We, de we debate and then clear everything that goes on and we're like a one-way communication machine. Right, and I and I think that's really the smart way of doing it. I mean, that's the safest way of doing it. But um, but that doesn't include individuals. And I think we should probably update our 2015 social media policy at a minimum and put that in this little this little book for volunteers. Book are, are those the only two resources? It was um, New York State Info, uh, New York State um, IT and uh, Cities. Did yeah. Does um, Albany have, does the uh, uh, NICOM have something? I, I, got, I think I got these. This has been so long in the making. I think I got these from NICOM. Okay. I'm pretty sure I got these from NICOM. Okay. All right. Um, tree law? This counts for outdoor dining permits. Are we, do you want to go in order? Oh, do you want to go in order or? Where, where were we? We were uh, social media project. Uh, Eight. Oh, the tree law. Yeah. All right. Planning board this comments should, on tree law. This should be really quick. And um, the planning board worked, um, the planning board had some comments about harmonizing the tree law with um, some planning board issues. And I think. Beverly, did Bob, I mean, Bob, did Beverly go over this with you? No, she has not. Okay, so, so it's, I guess it's for, for then, oh, I'm sorry, I thought she did. So there's just, there were a couple of technical things that they came up with and gave to the tree committee. And then there was, um, and they, they seem to be like definitions and just comparison. So maybe Bob needs to look at this for next week. And then there was one other issue um, that I think Jerry knew, Jerry and Dan knew about last week or a few weeks ago. If a tree falls, that we didn't cover that. Like obviously it's not, you know, if a tree, if a tree falls down in a storm, it's not likely to be replanted, right, Jerry? Correct. I mean we can't. So how so how do we re we remove it or some we, I mean, one removes their tree. Do they have to get a permit to remove it if it's fallen? Like, what's that process? And so we just need to stick that in there. Uh huh. Yeah. So so it's a it's a tree removal permit to remove the tree, but there wouldn't be a replacement requirement. There's right. a replacement required for any tree that's removed. Right. Um, that's standing, of course. That's you know, dead or dying or diseased or hit by lightning. But I don't think we would make that. A requirement. I hope it's not that way. And if not, we can clear that up. But I hope I we think, don't make it a requirement. I think it just wasn't clear. I think it just wasn't clear. Yep. So okay. I think the, and so Beverly, the tree committee's meeting in two weeks and they were gonna they were gonna talk about it. They thought it wasn't clear. So I guess the question is Bob, if you take a look at this and see if you agree. <laughs> this will be version 20. This will be version 21. 
22 of the two. This will start again, Nora. This will get a new letter. Oh, and, uh, <laughs> oh no, no, no. Oh, well, we'll start. You have to start again, I guess. A new letter. Yeah. It would be an amendment. So, so one yeah. thing. Oh, we're going to get it right. Oh. It's going to be one version and one version only. <laughs> The, the one thing that I think would would require some debate is the tree fund or bank. Uh -huh. Tree bank is different than a tree fund. A tree fund is a, a developer putting money uh, because they can't plant a tree on their property right. and uh, providing us money um, to plant the tree someplace else. I don't have a problem with that, but that has to be that has to be the board's. I you know, the board has to be good with that. And I think the planning board recommended it. It's not that it's not up to, it isn't up to anybody but the planning board because um, I think they are in some situations where there have been a lot of trees removed and simply you couldn't plant the number that needed to be replanted. Yeah. So I think they're, they're, they wanted to be able to, you know, sort of leverage it into trees in, in other places. It, because if you can't accommodate, I don't know, replacement of 80 trees or whatever it is, you want to maybe make sure the village has those 80 trees to plant someplace else. Yeah, so Scarsdale did that according to what to what's here, but the uh, yeah. the price for the tree is is too low. We're we're paying you know much higher than that on the next tree planting. Uh, so, in fact, the best prices we've ever gotten were were higher than you know 250 dollars. And maybe it doesn't have to be an amount per tree. Maybe it's market rate. Yeah. We can always give them market rate because we bid out trees every year. Yeah, so, it so we be, can always tell them what it costs. Market rate. Well, exactly. if you spell market rates, it should be market rates to the, for, that the, for the village. Yeah. Yeah. What we you pay, know. right? Well, it's what we pay and what what the type of tree is that is desired, as opposed to what a developer may wish. Well, I, and I think the way this would be structured is it would be part of their um, a condition of their getting their permit right getting their site plan approval so so mm -hmm. that we, yeah if we're planting trees on public property you know that's not just the tree it's the water the gator bag the time we spend to mm -hmm. build a gator bag every week yeah it adds up, it adds up. okay so those are the so i guess i guess we should wait for another couple weeks to see what Bob thinks if we're ready for something to then try and schedule yeah. a public hearing in the in the attempt that we have version one and only version one. Recom discussed it already? The tree Maybe. committee discussed these changes, oh. but they didn't discuss the idea of um, of specifically saying what happens if a tree falls. Okay. I, I created some language and then sent to the tree committee. I'll send it to Bob as well. Yeah, that's an easy one. And then, of course, they're eager to hear what we hear back from the attorney general. But we haven't, you know, we don't know when we'll hear back, right? No. I bet that, no. All right, so that's... Uh, Is that the one we heard that we sent it to the, uh, to the controller's office? Yes, that's right. I, I believe it was at the beginning of this year or end of last year. They said they forwarded to the controller's office. Didn't, yeah. And didn't we include that in the agenda? Or was there something by mistake? Or was there something else that we just got recently? No, the, the, mo the most recent we re one received was regarding the referenda. Oh, and yeah. That yeah. Forwarded right. to the BOE. Yeah. The BOE, right. But so we're still waiting for the controller to get back to us, yeah. right? Yeah, we're still waiting. We All are. right, so that's on hold. <clears throat> um, now, uh, discounts what? for outdoor dining permits using public parking. Um, what do we think about that? So I can where, tell you what we've done. Just um, where, where are just where are we? One one we, have we have to go to I. I think, I think we have to go to I. Lou, Lou really wants to go to M, but I think we have to he go to really I. He wants to go to M. He does. He keeps going. He wants to go to M. We got to go to I. Uh, I can introduce I when you're ready. Okay, I, I got. Okay, yeah. Okay, so let's. Uh, general uh, municipal law 
civil service law. Okay, this is the this is what Shelley Mayer was talking about the um, adjustment to the um, uh, to the uh, uh, civil service law that would allow um, uh, our uh, emergency medical volunteers to uh, to get health insurance. Am I correct on that? I think it's employees. I don't know if it's volunteers. So, so I, I believe it's employees because volunteers doesn't go through the civil service process. Employees go through the civil service process. All right. And I think right now, so, so um, um, several months ago, I went to a uh, municipal administrators association meeting and uh, we discussed this. Um, Chris Bradbury from Rybrook was a long time a, a, a manager there. He brought this up. And so it looks like it's got some traction. Now, I'll just read the middle paragraph um, from, uh, from our association, our managers association, Dan and I belong to. Most recently, state legislation, uh, Senate 8432, was introduced to the Senate, which, among other things, would designate EMS as an essential service to be provided in some form as determined by municipalities, currently not a requirement. Uh, it also creates a path to obtain um, access to group, group health insurance, which is the uh, NYSHIP, which is our, our health insurance, the retirement system training, and developing regional and state guidelines and standards to provide EMS services. I think that's what the bill is introducing. Um, there's a letter in the packet, or pretty long letter from Chris Bradbury, who's kind of spearheading this. Um, and it says here, uh, let me see. Actually, it's a different bill number. But it says here um, what was introduced or what is being considered uh, and referred to the Committee on Local Governments is uh, an act to amend the general municipal law uh, in relation to classifying emergency medical service provided by municipalities, essential service to provide and apply for and receive state aid. That's a different aspect altogether. So basically, I think that's what they're looking for. They're looking for, and Mr. Sarnoff, you got to jump in if I'm a little off base, but I think they're looking for EMS um, to be employees like um, to have access to certain benefits, just like the employees of a municipality, uh, police, if they have a paid fire, you know, uh, emergency, emergency response, uh, emergency, you know, um, disaster personnel, those kinds of things. Yeah, that's basically, uh, basically deeming EMS as an emergency service. Well, and not as a volunteer service. I think that's the, the key. Yeah. Well, so some in some com communities of volunteer and some of that they're employees. Right, but but what I think I think I you know I have a cousin who's been an EMT for forty years and. Um, it's just and they're in Massachusetts and there's just a real switch because they can't afford for people to do it in a volunteer basis anymore. It's, it needs to be, uh, it needs to be professionalized. I mean, it is professionalized. It, it doesn't matter. It's like our fire department. It doesn't matter whether you're a volunteer or that you're paid, you're still highly trained. And um, that everything is moving towards a paid system. And what's happening is there aren't enough EMTs because people don't get the kinds of benefits they need to do this. And we have a hybrid here where we have some volunteers and then we have paid. Yeah, that's the we also have a, um, a relationship, you know, operational relationship with the town uh, and Larchmont's uh, um, volunteer ambulance. I'm sorry, ambulance squad. So basically we're uh, being asked to express our support for the state legislation. That's what the ask is. Legislation would allow members of volunteer fire and ambulance companies to be eligible for health benefits. Mm -hmm. So it does include volunteers. Yes. Yeah, that's what I, I didn't think right. it did. That's the amendment. And uh, that's similar to uh, the fire department because volunteer firefighters are eligible for our health insurance. They have to pay the full cost, but they are right. eligible to participate. So I, I think this is something we, we would support. So let's just uh, uh, put it on the uh, agenda in two weeks. Talk about it. Agree? Yeah. That's okay. fine. Okay. All righty then. 
M. Now we get to M. M. Oh. This, counts, this counts for outdoor uh, uh, parking uh, permits uh, for the, so, uh, yeah. During the first year of the pandemic, uh, 2020, but we did not charge for outdoor, um, uh, I'll call, I call them right. parking spot cafes. Mm -hmm. um, the second year, we charged $72 per spot mm -hmm. um, per week. Uh, this year, we're at full rate at $120 per spot per week. A uh, week is seven days, but we're only charging for six days because we don't charge mm -hmm. parking on Sundays. So we went from zero to 72 to 120. Um, it's pretty clear to me that the restaurants that um, take us up on this benefit, um, in essence, double, maybe even more, their space for serving uh, um, uh, patrons. Uh, the first year, it became kind of like a shanty town with a lot of uh, makeshift sheds and covers and tarps and all of that stuff. And I didn't really like the look of that. So the second year, I didn't allow that. Um, we put up the blocks and um, we take away the blocks uh, right around uh, you know Thanksgiving time, I guess, whenever we do it. But um, we're not that far off from, you know, it's $48, whatever it is. But we're not that far off from, uh, from last year uh, per week. I understand that, uh, you know, some of these businesses want uh, a discount when they can get it and, you know, while it's rolling. But the truth is it continues to um, push Mamaronek shoppers Romantic Avenue shoppers to the back lots because um, we already have uh, issues with parking on the main strip, which you know is the parking is tight. Strip. Parking is tight, so the, it's, it's not a small consideration for us. I guess the the question is, um, did we want to offer any uh, minimal discount, let's say, to a Chamber of Commerce members or something along those lines? That's it. Uh, I'm willing to hear what the board suggests. At the end of the day, I make the decision. But you know, whatever the board wants me to do, I'm good with. I want to make uh, I want to make the businesses as happy if possible, and and of course, I definitely want to make the board happy. I, I don't think we can offer we can't offer a benefit to a chamber member that another that yeah. another we that another merchant in the community doesn't have. I mean, that I don't think we have that. that. Because we had that conversation two years ago when they, you mm -hmm. know, when they wanted to, to limit the, this to just chamber members and we couldn't do that. We limited it initially to people who had already filed for a sidewalk cafe permit. All right. I, I just wanted to raise the issue. It was raised with me. Yeah. I said I'd put it on and we would talk about it. So I just wanted to see what, uh, what you thought about it. That's basically it. Um, you know, Rye did this extensively two years ago. I mean, we all, a lot of communities did it two years ago and didn't charge for parking, in part because we weren't charging for parking anyway. We were, mm -hmm. you know, more collecting and we were just trying to sort of feel our way through the pandemic. Rye did not close Purchase Street last year for this. And they're not doing it this year. Larchmont has left a lot open. I'm curious as to what they're doing for parking because they didn't charge for parking until about a year ago. Oh, they well, are, yeah. right. They're they're barely enforcing the parking. They are ostensibly charging for, so uh, they have their own issues. So I would um, want to stay away. I would want to stay away from the Larchmont model of yeah. constructing, mm -hmm. um, you know, sheds. It's not a good look. Better term in the street. That's like the city model. Mm -hmm. um, but um, you know, if the if the board wants to um, wants to give a a, a a 10, 15% discount on the, on the full rate um, and give the business owners who have uh, street dining, you know, mm -hmm. intentions of, of getting street dining, uh, that, would be, that would be something. It's really up to you. It's really up to you. And I think the, you know, we have an issue for a lot of other businesses that are also members of the chamber who, where they, you know, are having problems, you know, because, People can't don't want to park in the back, and you know, sure. um, uh, and we're taking away parking, you know, to allow them. You know, I think it's a, a, 
a much different concept when you can only do it outdoors. But I think Jerry has pointed out that, um, you know, in most cases it's been doubled or increased, <laughs> double, you know, the uh, space. Um, and I think that uh, we, you know, if they want to take advantage of it, that's fine. And if they don't, that's fine. Um, uh, I, I know a lot of people think it is a, uh, you know, a money, but in relation to what you can, no, I think I have it. Go you can you know, work out in the numbers, not an unreasonable approach. And I, I gather, Jerry, you know, that's, that's your recommendation to, because you've already said it. <laughs> yep. You know, I mean, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm willing to be a little flexible. I think, but I, think, I think we should, you know, go along with it. All right, I think uh, we're probably all agreed on that. I, I want to. I, I I said I would bring it up, and uh, there it is. And we've. we've Nora, talked. what do you want to say? Nora? Sally has her hand up. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. I just saw Sally's hand up. Oh, I'm sorry. Who has their hand up? Sally. Oh. Sally. Sally. I had my hand up, Nora. Yeah. Oh, not on purpose. I'm a panelist. <laughs> I don't need to raise my hand. I know you can just talk if you want to. <laughs> Yes, I'm good. Thank you. All right. All right, that's it then. Um, okay, you yeah. get a prize. We ended at 725. You get a yeah. prize. Well, that, that's it. Yeah, the other things I think we can wait on. Um, well, let's uh, let's take a break uh, and uh, come back at eight o'clock. Um, I'll take a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. See you in a little it's while. Unanimous. There you go. We'll see you at eight o'clock. Well, it's it's okay. Thank you. Okay. What was he saying?
right? Are we for the recording? Yeah. You don't have quorum. Jeff Corn. Uh, Dan's here. Okay, here we go. All right, ready to go. Open meeting. Good evening, everyone. This is the uh, regular meeting of the Village of Amaranic Board of Trustees. Mayor uh, Murphy and uh, Trustee DeFour absent. Um, begin by standing for the Pledge of Allegiance. Oh, wait, wait we have to open the meeting first, right? Sorry, uh, a motion to open the meeting, please. So move. Okay, uh, second, unanimous. Since the meeting is open, staff of the Pledge of Allegiance, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right. Okay, uh, adoption of the agenda. Need a motion, please. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Unanimous. All right. Okay, communication uh, presentations from the board. Uh, sustainable Westchester, are they, you here? Yes. Hello. Hi. Hi. Okay. All right. Mr. Uh, uh, Nick Pedro. Uh, we're all yours. Awesome. Thanks. Share my screen here. <clears throat> and we're running. Okay. Well, thank you, uh, board, for having me. Hello to everyone out there. My name is Nick Tedrow. Hi. <laughs> I'm the uh, program manager for Westchester Power, a program here at Sustainable Westchester. Uh, going to talk you through sort of where we're at with the program and this contract that we're in that's currently winding down. Uh, and uh, discuss the steps forward, what we have planned. So um, just at a brief level, if, if anyone out there is not familiar, Sustainable <laughs> Westchester is a nonprofit consortium uh, in Westchester County. Our members are uh, 44 of the 45 municipalities <laughs> in the county. Um, and uh, a subset of those 29 that you can see here uh, participate in Westchester Power uh, with Yonkers joining this last month as the 29th municipality. Uh, our rough customer account um, total is up to roughly 147,000 residential and small businesses. <clears throat> so uh, in terms of what the program's done, uh, we've had quite an impact in uh, promoting renewable energy and really accelerating the adoption of clean energy in the state. Uh, you can see impact wise, uh, countywide throughout all the municipalities. We've mitigated roughly 1.1 million metric tons of CO2 from the atmosphere and Marinick's contribution to that is 59,000 roughly. So in more tangible terms than metric tons of CO2, you can see what that's meant uh, in terms of cars taken off the road for a year and tree seedlings grown and planted and grown for 10. So uh, definitely have had a huge impact reducing emissions um, and, and having a benefit to our communities here in the county. And we're hoping to continue that and grow, of course. So, to date, in terms of uh, how the contracts have performed uh, rate-wise, rate, rate wise, um, you can see this graph here is just the visual of since our inception, uh, which uh, the Marinick Village has been uh, with the program since the beginning. So, um, you know, valleys and mountains there, but consistently across, you can see our fixed rates um, have remained. Um, and certainly in these last <laughs> January, you can see there Towards the end, that big blue Con Edison bar spiking up in the middle. Um, that was um, a good time to have Westchester Power in terms of a, a little cost cap and assurance on what we were going to pay that month. And in a month that was really tough for a lot of people, um, all of us really, with, with a spike across the board in Con Edison billing. So our current rates are uh, here at the top 100% renewable energy supply, 7.41 cents per kilowatt hour, and our standard supply, 6.75 cents per 
kilowatt hour, and these are fixed through the end of June. Um, this contract <clears throat> and these rates launched uh, January 1st, 2021. So we're at the end of that 18 month term here now in a couple months. Um, a different way of looking here, just at the sort of monthly average in terms of cents per kilowatt hour um, through, through May or through the beginning of May, um, you know, since the launch on the right side there, you can see we've trailed a little bit um, on the average um, to the Con Edison rates, uh, except for in the residential standard supply column. But this current contract, again, has, has performed really well uh, on an average cost cents per kilowatt hour uh, against Con Edison um, across all categories, even the renewable um, being financially competitive and, and better than Con Edison. So um, really just emphasizing again, the, the great way we've been able to um, collectively here through your participation and participation of other municipalities bring cost-effective uh, renewable energy at community scale. So, um, uh, so now moving on to you know, what's gonna happen here with the end of this contract, we're trying to move into sort of a Westchester Power 2.0 phase where uh, we're able to expand our capacity for economic and environmental impact. So that'll be centered a lot around increasing our supplier pool so that we have more competition and therefore are getting better pricing and more competitive pricing uh, to go out to our customer, resident customers with. Um, you know, and this will also entail us building more tools in our toolbox and capacity to do uh, different things, support longer term contracts and uh, more flexible supply formats, uh, going to the market more, um, with more agility when it's good times, perhaps, and blending uh, better pricing in, uh, offering different kind of rates, things like that. And then uh, in the long run, you know, we're hope this will all bring even more price stability. And hopefully also we're, we're getting to a point um, where we're able to build renewable construction and support those projects being uh, developed here in our communities and directly having green energy generation at the local level. So um, aspirations for what we're trying to do here with these 2.0 imperatives. So currently you can see our model here in this box on the right is the you know, way we currently do our supply contract um, work. We, we go out and we run an auction with a bunch of retail um, ESCOs. So ESCOs are the only entities in besides utilities that have the authority in the state of New York to serve retail customers. So we have to run an auction where we invite different ESCO companies to come bid on our aggregate supply or uh, capacity and, and then award a contract based on the results of that auction, which is limiting in a few ways. It's, you know, we have to only, we can only invite ESCOs. So that doesn't necessarily include everyone who generates energy in the state. Um, it's a subset of those people. So, uh, and furthermore, we need to have a, an ESCO who's of, you know, pretty decent size and reputability so we can make sure we have a reliable, uh, obviously a supplier for our fairly large uh, aggregation. So trying to step out of that, that box and, and build more supply competition, we're looking to move into a 2.0 phase where we have a firm contracted that we, uh, who can serve as an ESCO and provide those services, um, those auxiliary pieces that make up a, a full retail offering. And then we can just expand our supply options by going out to the wholesale market and running auctions for just the energy portion of this whole retail supply package. So those, those entities out there who do generate electricity but don't operate as um, an ESCO retail supplier for whatever reason that doesn't fit their business interests, we can actually go to them now in this new proposed model uh, and run an auction for that energy piece and then sleeve it with our um, ESCO um, partner who can uh, provide those services to make it a full retail offering. So. That wholesale portion is about 50% of the cost the, or the generation, the energy part uh, or more. So obviously not insignificant. So by breaking those pieces up a little bit, uh, we can, if nothing else, get a look under the hood, understand the wholesale market better and continue to grow our capacities along the way. But we think this provides an opportunity to really um, increase our pricing um, competitiveness uh, by, by expanding into the wholesale market. So that's what we're looking to do in the with our next long-term contract is, is run this, <coughs> excuse me, um, run this new operation. So um, on that, how that'll look on the same day when we go out to do the traditional uh, auction with the ESCOs, we'll, we'll do that the same as we always have, invite the ESCOs to come out, 
bid for that whole retail um, supply offering. And then on the same day, run a wholesale energy block auction. And then, you know, at the end of all that, we can look and see what our best ESCO offerings were. And then we'll have our best wholesale prices as well with our known um, leaving cost associated or added into that and, and compare. So, um, like I said, we think that that has the potential to give us really competitive pricing, um, you know, even beyond what we've been able to do so far. Um, and again, nothing else. We're, we're growing our capacity, learning more about the market and diversifying the way we do our work. So with that, right now, when we're coming to you towards the end of this contract, June 30th, what we're recommending is a contract extension. Um, one reason for that is to have additional time to organize for this different enhanced auction process, um, which will, you know, has a few different pieces to it, modifying the RFP, uh, making sure we're, we're fully set up with the sleeving arrangement with our partners to make that uh, a reality, and, and also get new retail bidders to come and, and prepare who are interested in bidding on our contracts so that they're ready for the next auction, and as well as lining up the wholesale energy suppliers as well. Then we also have this other big consideration that we'll talk a little bit about here as well, uh, which is this period of high risk, high uncertainty uh, in the market. It's uh, no secret to anybody with many things in the world right now, costs are going through the roof uh, and uh, there's a lot of uncertainty out there and, and gas and energy at large uh, is, a, is certainly uh, front and center with that. So right now, as we're you know looking at what the pricing and the futures market holds, it's it looks pretty substantially high, and a lot of that we we've, we've been advised and believe is due to what they're calling you know uncertainty in the market since we don't know what's going to happen geopolitically and in, in Russia and Ukraine and some of these other factors. <clears throat> All of that uncertainty and risk is baked into the pricing right now. So we're hoping to move beyond that uh, with a contract extension and look you know, towards the future a little bit before locking into a long-term contract. So we've gotten approval from DPS uh, up to six months for a contract extension. What we've been seeing right now is that five months looks like it's sort of the sweet spot so far in the indicatives we've received, which we'll look at here uh, for uh, an extension target. So, and then just noting, obviously we touched on what our rates are uh, a little bit before, those are far below what the market rates are now. So we'll be contracting for an extension at a significantly higher rate uh, than what we're currently at for this through June 30th. Uh, so the timeline of the new steps, um, we're confirming, we sort of moved through this, but um, we sort of settled with uh, chief electeds and admins a couple weeks ago on what we thought our price not to exceed should be for a new, new MOU extension and right now we're you know going through the process of getting everybody on board which is why I'm here with you today um, to, to get uh, Mamaronek Village on board with the new price not to exceed and this MOU participation um, and then we're moving right along to executing contracts mid this mid month this month to go ahead and act on um, a price once we once we can do that with everybody uh, in board on board. And then it looks just like a contract renewal. We have to do a mailing to all the current participants, letting them know about the new pricing, giving them the opt-out period. Uh, that ends at the end of mid-June, and then we'll roll July 1 with the new um, extension date and, and extension prices in that period. And then when we get to the end of that and we're preparing for the new enhanced auction version, we'll be um, you know, doing that mid-August and uh, looking to lock into a longer-term contract at that point. So um, my slideshow appears to be stuck. Sorry, I can't. One second. All right. Um, so just to give you know a little setup here before I sort of deliver what the new proposal we have for price not to exceed is, just touching on where the market's at a little bit more. Natural gas prices, as I said, are on the rise. Um, the futures have doubled. Um, since the time we last contracted for this aggregation back in the end of 2020-ish. Um, and so, as a, and as I also said before, energy constitutes about half of that full electricity retail price that we see when we get the final uh, rate, dollar cents per kilowatt hour. So, you know, looking at that alone, our current standard price of 6.7 cents from 2020, if we say a 50% increase um, to, the, to the gas price there, that brings up to roughly 10.05 just alone on that. Um, and then we have RECs and whatnot to consider for the renewable option. So 
Uh, all signs currently point to these things continuing. You know, we're going to be continuing to see increased reliance on other uh, market sources from Europe, who has a huge demand from gas and has gotten gets a lot of their gas from Russia, um, and a lot of plans from the United States to increase its liquid natural gas exports to to fulfill that, where they're willing to pay exorbitant prices compared to what U.S. consumers pay. So. A lot of a lot of pressures that don't seem to immediately be on the horizon of changing are going to be, continue to push these prices up. So similar with the REC and the renewable energy credit um, current contract we're on right now, we we settled at 0.6 for that REC price. Uh, the recent contracts are that were executed for NYSEG territory and the Yonkers contract it was up to 1.5 cents roughly, and now with current indicatives, we're seeing you know 1.7, 1.82 with the losses factor that they have to. Uh, generate um, for over purchasing. So it's it's all going up. This is all painting the picture. Things are going up. Uh, and a lot of the, the rec price pressure has been for a variety of reasons. Uh, you know, out, out of state purchasers swooping up recs and then selling them for a mark at, markup in other states. Um, and so there's been some um, artificial manipulation there going on at the state level. Uh, price targets again. This is just a snapshot of what we were current, what we were seeing very recently. When we go to the New York State resource for purchasing or shopping for ESCO contracts, uh, similar renewable uh, fixed rate contracts. You can see it's, it's in the 13 cents range there. And uh, this is a you know traditionally what's been the most competitive renewable energy supplier recently. And we went into their actual website and started looking up an account or a contracts to try and get that really specific quote again, 13 something. So um, that's where the renewable energy prices are right now, if you were to go out and try and find a contract with a private company. So I'm almost done, I promise. Um, these are the, the way that our indicatives have been tracking um, since here. So these, rep these indicatives one and two represent a couple of suppliers and the pricing date when we get these quotes of what they're uh, pricing the energy um, at over time. So um, as we've gone on, it's slowly crept up. And again, five months is really where we've been focused now as the best price point. And um, when we've sort of resolved on a price not to exceed, we were looking at this 323 uh, price of 994 for, a, um, for the energy, and then looking at that 182 for the rec adder, which rolled up to roughly 1176 here down at the bottom. Um, so even since then, we've had an indicative of um, March 30th, and that price has ticked up again since then. So um, it, it's been, you know, steadily creeping for some time now, um, if not jumping. So what we're proposing is a price not to exceed of 12 and a half cents. Uh, it, it tracks with what we've been seeing in, as the margin of movement over the weeks as we've tracked the indicative from our suppliers, uh, from potential suppliers. Um, in this case, we're, we're looking to extend directly with Constellation, the current supplier, and what they've been giving us. Um, so planning with that in mind of planning for some growth, we're trying to set a ceiling that we think should be attainable for 12 and a half cents. Um, we've had some recent experience with these rapidly upward pricing movements in the fall or in the summer, there was a huge spike due to Ida and some other things going on that caused energy prices to go, you know, start really going up then, which uh, got us caught us a little bit where we had MOUs executed with a price not to exceed with those NYSEG communities that ended up not being executable with a rapid rise in pricing that um, sort of outpaced our ability to sign a contract. So uh, obviously that was ended up being fairly disastrous and that, um, you know, we didn't have enough buffer and we were stuck where we didn't have enough timeline to reset targets and stay on the schedule with that contract renewal. And then, um, uh, we, we had a lot of challenges where we basically had to pause the program and send out letters to uh, residents that the program was pausing. And they were also getting utility switch letters saying, hey, you're going back into NYSEG um, and, and got that up, you know, and then they had to get an opt out notice later on. So it was really just kind of a mess. And uh, obviously, folks weren't unhappy about it. And with the timing of when it happened. Uh, with all of this spiking in January um, with the utilities, NYSEG was the same way. Uh, people, you know, obviously felt particularly abandoned with rates, you know, getting dropped from the program and then having all these rates hit them really high and hard uh, in that period. So it was really bad uh, on many levels. So, you know, when we talk about what's at stake here of, of having to pause the program, um, you know, all the value features we talk about, having that rate cap, that insurance against those spikes, even, you know, for that one piece of the bill is really critical and important for a lot of folks. 
Um, and um, you know, having the ability for folks to change supply, that's a great thing as well. Uh, and just the stability really overall and the, the availability of this you know, cost competitive renewable energy option um, that we offer to, to residents. So with that, that's the, the story of why we're here uh, to talk about an extension and hope that you'll support moving forward uh, you know, with a resolution or whatever for a price not to exceed MOU of 12.5 cents per kilowatt hour um, so that we can sort of tie through these, these months and get to a point where we can uh, move forward with the new enhanced auction process that'll um, hopefully, and we feel, will provide a lot of uh, great competition and, and ultimately a great price for a long-term contract at that point. Thank, thank you, Nick. Um, yeah. I'm a, I'm a big fan of what you, you folks do, and I believe it's probably one of many things that we need to do in tandem to um, break our fossil fuel habit uh, and, uh, and uh, make our communities more resilient. So uh, I am, um, I'm appreciative of the, uh, of the uh, presentation and, uh, and uh, thank you very much for coming in. We appreciate it. Okay, great. Yeah, if anyone has any questions about any of this, feel free to reach back out to us. Um, otherwise, I yeah. Well, Lou, yeah. I have a question. So Nick, so what's our um, renewable price right now? If our renewable remember. price, yeah, it's 7.41 cents per kilowatt hour. Right. And we're anticipating going up to 12 and a half or just under 12 and a half. That is what we're, yeah, proposing to be the ceiling for this MOU. So we're targeting a, a price somewhere at or below 12.5 um, with, with some risk that, you know, it doesn't end up happening and we get stuck again and we have to hope the market kind of hides our way. Um, so so am, I at a line, am I at a line by saying that it seems like our renewables just follow the trend of the market rate and not yeah, necessarily benefit us because we obviously know that renewables, tell, tell everyone where we're getting renewables from. Yeah, so um, renewables in, the New York, in New York state, renewables are uh, represented, you know, in, in through our program, through renewable energy credits. So um, we're, without getting too much into the, explaining what the rec market is, Basically, we're um, buying up, or our supplier on behalf of us is, in order to represent this energy, is buying up these credits on, uh, on the market through NYSERDA, through their tracking program. So these different generators of renewable energy generate this energy, and it all has, goes into um, a repository where it has you know, a tag to it, and um, each credit is represented as one megawatt hour of renewable energy generation. So when the supplier is getting us, you know, our renewable energy supply, they're buying up these credits in the amount requisite to represent the renewable energy that we're um, supplying for our program. So uh, with us, it's New York State Hydropower uh, RECs. So uh, when we lock in our contract, they go into the market and they are into, into the market and they buy up enough RECs for uh, the energy, the representative energy for our, um, our participants who are going to be on the renewable supply. The renewable energy is not cheaper. It's just that we get the credits. That's why the credits are, are, are brokered or bought and sold. And that's why we're getting the, the cheaper rate. Yeah, the well, so anyone who's, you know, most people who are a lot of a lot of folks are on there buying these credits. So businesses do it for their environmental compliance reasons. And a lot of folks buy these credits. So um, yeah, the, the renewable energy, you can think of it as sort of a premium that we broker for on the market, but the price for that is set, you know, um, by the state for those credits. Um, okay. So well, the five month extension with Constellation is because we think the market or you think the market's going to potentially get better or not necessarily, because the long-term numbers were even higher, but at least there's stability in the long-term numbers. Yeah, so, you know, the thinking is that one, we do want to, like I said, prepare for this new auction format. But two, we do think, you know, right now there is the possibility for, you know, things to change in the world and more stability to come into uh, play with, you know, whatever happens geopolitically. But, you know, we're not hurt by, you know, 
at this point, trying to ride through the current market and anticipate or hope at least, <laughs> maybe hope's the right word, that things do uh, relax and ease uh, in the market a bit in five months plus uh, so that we can uh, be positioned and um, to, to take advantage of lower rates and lower future market prices than uh, what's currently out there right now. Um, because there's a huge, just a huge uncertainty out there. You know, no market expert can tell you what's going to happen in the world or what's going to happen with futures right now. So it's a, you know, a pretty high risk move to lock into prices that are, you know, particularly exorbitant in the current time. And so, the, so, so in five months, in five months, you'll be back to us asking us to, or you'll give us projections regarding uh, the next auction platform that you guys uh, plan to participate in. Yeah, we'll have, you know, some market analysis, I'm sure, but, you know, we'll also be not talking in the strict terms of a contract extension, where, okay. you know, we'll be bringing again, a, we'll be opening it up to a full auction again and having multiple suppliers come, you know, competing against each other uh, through a competitive bid process, um, uh, which will, you know, bring more, um, you know, price competition to, to the table and right. won't be as constricted as working through one particular supplier and negotiating that way. And you guys are not comfortable doing that now. You just want the extension to give yourself that 150 day buffer. Yeah, there's that was a uh, you know part of the, a big part of it, and uh, the the market effects of what's going on right now is there's a lot of suppliers who aren't comfortable, you know, really pricing out stuff right now uh, okay. because they don't know what's going to happen. So it's actually kind of put a chilling effect um, out there for a lot of suppliers who um, are very wary of. Um, entering into long-term uh, agreements. So it's mostly them and not us necessarily. Yeah, not necessarily. Well, we hope to be more agile going forward in the future. So we're gonna do things that'll make it uh, where we don't have to, you know, hopefully do these mechanical month long processes and we can right. find ways to abbreviate our compliance um, steps with the, you know, through DPS where um, we can strike when the when the market's hot and things like that, but um, really that's not really the, the main issue here. It's just a matter of the market being completely, you know, in uncharted territory. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah, no problem. Just one question, what do you need from us at the moment, at this point? Yeah, so um, we've sent out the, the final draft of the MOU that's uh, in the hands of, uh, I think the, <laughs> excuse me, mayor administrators over there uh, with you all. So um, we are looking to, I think I, pointed out our timeline before, we're hoping to execute our energy service agreement extension with the, the supplier mid month. So the soonest we could get the approval uh, and signature on the MOU would enable us, um, you know, and we're getting that from all 24 of the municipalities right now to go out and, um, uh, you know, give us the freedom to execute that ESA if we were to get that price point we're looking for. So as soon as you all are able, if there's a resolution that needs to pass um, to authorize that, um, that would be what we need is uh, that memorandum. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you. All right. Thank you. See you, Nick. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. Yeah. Yep. Bye bye. All right. Uh, next, the communications to the board. It's a okay, can we, can Luke, just for a minute, okay. uh, Jerry, are, are you asking for a resolution from the board or is this something that you can execute? No, uh, I can't. Uh, we can do this next meeting on the 25th. We don't have to do it now. Yeah, I, um, we can do it on 25th. It's close enough. They're going to proceed how they're going to need. They're going to proceed as long as everyone on this Zoom is comfortable with what Nick has just explained to us, which which I am. I understand it. Um, then we can do it on the 25th. Nick, we're our next meeting is April 25th, and That's so the next okay. yeah, so I can give you I can give you a, a, an email. You know that we discussed and we moving forward, but but you know we don't necessarily have on the agenda, nor did we provide and did we prepare for a resolution. I don't think so tonight. I mean, let me pull my. No, no. no we don't have that. Okay. Yeah. Right, so um, the twenty fifth is our next meeting. Okay. Uh, yeah. Let Let's definitely talk then uh, offline, and um, obviously that's uh, we're hope our target here is to hopefully get every obviously ASAP. We were aiming for this week because then we. You know, have a tight turnaround to try and execute this ESA and then get all the munis to sign it um, right. you know, before markets move. So whatever you can do, we'll work around whatever you got. But uh, yeah, it, it's really an extension onto our current agreement, not necessarily a brand new agreement, a brand new MOA, uh, MOU. The MOU is new because it's got a new price point. So um, 
Sorry, we, were you gonna say something, Mr. Lucas? Well, yeah. we, have a, we have a meeting tomorrow. We have a budget meeting tomorrow. Oh, we can so, throw it on tomorrow. Yeah, and and Glenn has his hand up, but we have a budget meeting tomorrow. So if 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 that's amenable, if that solves a problem, maybe we could do it tomorrow. Yeah, because Nick, when you said mid month, we're, today's the eleventh. So I'm not sure if we get more mid month than this. So. No, I hear you. yeah. But we were but, talk during but the trustee Lucas has a point. We we do have a, a budget meeting tomorrow, which we can slip something in, something like this. So yeah, if you um, could, that'd be that'd be you know great. Yeah, we were we crunched to try and get all these meetings in and um yeah, so <laughs> sorry about off. that. Dan, you have a template for this from uh from sustainable. Put your put your mic on. Dan, you're you're, you're well, muted. There's a resolution we've done the last couple of times. So a little yeah. bit different. So um, if you have the agreement, I'll just uh, take a quick look at it and fly it up for tomorrow night. So Nick, we'll send you tomorrow in the morning. We'll send you a template. Uh, I'm not. A, I'm sorry. A template. A, a resolution. We've. We've. Um, uh, the board has approved in the past, and we have to make. If we have to make some changes, we'll do that during the day, and then okay. present it to the board uh, in the evening, and they'll have to vote to add an item to the agenda. Okay. All right. That's great. I appreciate that. Yeah. Thank you so much. That's as fast right, as it gets around here. No, I mean, that's that's awesome. Yeah, the next day, that's that's amazing. So we appreciate your flexibility on that. We we aim to please. <laughs> okay. Right here. Thanks a lot. Right. Thank okay, uh, commu uh, communications to the board. Uh, there's a five minute limit on this, uh, and I already heard that uh, Glenn has his hand up. Am I correct? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I have a quick question for Nick to start. Okay. Well. Um, we can ask him tomorrow by email, Glenn, but he's gone now. Okay. He's, he's, Nick is still on. Oh, good. Yeah. Is. Okay, uh, good. Let, let's, uh, let, let's, let's start with the communications uh, uh, um, uh, presentation. If you have a question, uh, we'll, we'll get it to him. Okay. Well, the, the question to him is going to be, uh, bottom line, what kind of uh, uh, price increase are the residents of the village of Mamarnik looking at starting uh when the new contract comes in uh and I you can answer you. that okay, can no. answer. if you, you want to shoot me an email i don't do you all answer through email is that what you would like yeah we'll, 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 we'll do it tomorrow right now okay okay we'll do with it tomorrow thank you thank you nick thank okay. you all, all right. right i'll talk to you tomorrow glenn sorry about that thank you. all right no problem. uh glenn clock's running yes the, okay. uh, town of, the town of Mamarnik sent out their tax bills and uh, a few residents actually called me with uh, some questions on it. And I just wanted to uh, answer them publicly uh, if anybody uh, wasn't sure. Uh, we uh, get charged a sewer rate on the town tax bill. <clears throat> That's for our sewer district which basically is we have our own <clears throat> we have our own treatment plant down here. Mamaronic is part of our district. Our local bill is for our local sewer pipes. We have a refuge tax, which is Westchester County's recycling costs. And the third one is EMS. The town of Mamaronic actually runs our EMS. So two thirds of us pay a um, ambulance tax to uh, directly to the uh, town of Mamaroneck. Right now, we, uh, we pay uh, a fee either once or twice a year to cover those residents. So those were just the three que uh, questions that I was asked. On the rental law, uh, one of the one, the big uh, actual protection on the rental law, and Bob can check this, is actually the tenants. New York State is very very protective of the tenants in New York, and I think a, a lot of the uh, restrictions that you would find on the rental law has to do with you can't force a tenant to allow somebody to go into an apartment and have the apartment checked. And believe it a lot or not, a lot of people mm -hmm. simply do not want people that don't belong in their house in their house. You know, whether, whether the, the landlord has got substandard or whatever else, there's a lot of people who just don't want public officials in their house for any reason. 
but Bob can research that. We had uh, some real good uh, budget meetings. Uh, a, a lot of good things have uh, come out of them. Uh, one thing, and you know, this actually uh, go, goes back to new members of the trustees is, I think that we should put together a little book that, you know, basically it's almost like Budget, budgets for dummies, you know? Most of us know what we know because we've been here for 15 years. Augie ought to be a, a professor with the amount of times he's patiently explained the anushas of the budget, the capital and the debt. Anushkas? I, yeah. <laughs> the, the, um, well, sometimes I mispronounce words. But the bottom line is Augie's been very helpful to every one of us over the years has probably repeated the same thing a hundred times. Maybe uh, we can get together and have the budget committee with the staff write a simple pamphlet that when you become a trustee, here, here you go. These, these, are, this is the budget. These are the definitions of the budget, and this is what the, uh, these are what the different funds are. This is the operating. This is the capital. That way you get a running start. And instead of Augie 101, you can start at Augie 202. Thank you. All right, thank you, Greg. Uh, uh, Glenn, I, I think Glenn called me a dummy. I'm not quite sure, but uh, we'll take it. No, I, I certainly did not. <laughs> <laughs> In any event, uh, my thing has always been to um, uh, keep it simple. And, uh, uh, and uh, if, I, uh, if you can't understand it, uh, in simple terms, that it's too complicated it needs to be simplified. But that's uh, that's that. All right, here we go. Um, and no more more communications from the board. Yes. Um, we got public hearings now um, on the uh, on the tentative budget. And uh, let's uh, let's take a look at that. Okay. I think you need a motion to open. Oh yeah. Oh, okay. Thank you very much. A motion to open the public hearing. So move. Second. All in favor? Aye. Uh, all right. Any comments from the public on the tentative budget? There's a hand up. There is? Where do you see? Glenn. Glenn again? All right. Welcome back, Glenn. Thank you. Uh, tentative budget. Uh, there had been a question about the uh, sales tax. The sales tax numbers are actually coming in very well. Uh, the January and February sales tax have come in 15% uh, and 16.5% uh, above last year, according, according to Westchester County. The uh, problems that I do have with the budget is I think we're being uh, a, a little bit overly optimistic with our uh, with our um, income lines, though I do think that we probably have about a two hundred and fifty thousand dollar cushion in uh, sales tax and mortgage tax. the The other one that cautionary, and you just heard part of it, is our energy costs, whether they be electricity, heat utility costs, water, and our supplies costs are coming in extremely high. Every, every, every department head who has gone out and, and bought anything in the last three months, in, including Jerry when he bought the sand, including when we bought the, the timber, including uh, Rec and Park when they went out and they had to get seating and, and items like that, you're, you're, see, you're, you're seeing an extreme raise, yet in the budget itself, most of the supply lines are neutral and your overall energy is at um, a 20% increase. You could, you could do the budget the way it is, but I would not do any new hiring on the budget in, uh, for at least six months to see, to see how it pans out and see how these new supply costs actually uh, affect your expense side. Thank you.
Thank you, Glenn. We're okay. Any other comments? I can't see that. Okay, thank you. All right. Um, I guess we uh, close the, the public hearing now. I think we need to adjourn it. Okay, adjourn to um, four twenty-five. Yes. Um, so moved. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right, thank you. Okay, the next is a public hearing on uh, PLLB 2022 to exceed the tax cap. And that is the um, the um, template, the de facto um, uh, uh, process that keeps our options open as we as we proceed. So we can do it if we need to. Uh, any uh, input? Um, I move to uh, open a public hearing. Uh, motion to open a public hearing. I'm against it, but I know the majority of the board is in favor oh, of it. You, we need to open the hearing first. I, let me finish, Lou. Thank you. I'm going to I'll second it, on, but only because two members of the board are not here and the majority of the board are in favor of it. I am not in favor of it. I have been consistently against it uh, this year, last year, and before. Um, but um, in the right. interest of being fair to everybody, I'm going to second it. All right, it's just opening the public hearing. Uh, all in favor of, of having a public hearing? Aye. 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 Okay, unanimous. All right. Uh, any um, comments from the public about whether we should uh, go this route and leave this option open? None? No hands up. Okay, no so we have. Uh, uh, hmm? A motion to adjourn uh, the public hearing until 425. Still moved. That can with the set with the same proviso. Okay. Uh, all, all in favor? Aye. 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 All right. You, okay. Man. There we Thank go. You, okay. Audit of bills. Um, resolution authorizing budget amendment for over budget accounts. the backup material um let me appreciate that we just uh, vote on it Three through. Right. okay um motion to uh approve the budget amendments for overhaul uh, over budget accounts i think it'd be helpful if staff just gave it a, uh, a quick rundown for the people who are listening yeah uh, sure so so these five items i think there are five items are basically for for um, some minor um, adjustments in our uh, water heating uh, um, uh, mileage, which which is uh, uh, gas. Um, uh, we call it vehicle fuel and mileage, um, and then some. Uh, uh, the largest number is un unallocated insurance. Uh, we're taking from the revenue line of uh, um, insurance recoveries and moving it into our expense line. It spells it out there. It's pretty detailed. This these resolutions have come a long way in the since I started, and uh, uh, they look really good now. Very self-explanatory, but they're just some minor items just to uh, just to pay the bills. No, well, I understand, but a lot of people who are listening, they don't. Oh, have sure. I understand that. I appreciate that. You're right. You're right. Did our insurance rates go up because of uh -huh. Ida. So because of because of Ida, something something I'm not going to be able to get from FEMA. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, insurance insurance uh, um, popped up pretty good. And, and you know, uh, mo many of the board members know, um, most of the public doesn't know, but our insurance isn't just paid once a year, like a typical uh, uh, insurance policy of, you know, residential insurance policy. We have all, all different times when we have to pay and renew insurances. And so that's how, uh, that's how it's done around here. It's not, a, it's not a June 1 type of thing across the board, so. We get renewals all the time, and and we pay them, uh, we pay them as they come in. And then the other things are really just expenses have gone up. Yeah, m minor stuff, you know, a little bit here and there, for for different things. It could also be attributed to just, you know, um, you know, when you have a fifteen hundred dollar, fifteen hundred dollar water bill or or something along those lines. Let me see here. What is it? Con Ed. Well, Con Ed. And that yeah, was Con Ed. Yeah. So it's just it's just some minor stuff that uh, 
that has to get cleaned up in order for us to finish out paying the bills. Yep. Mm -hmm. All Thank right. You. Resolution to approve these uh, items. So moved. Second. In favor? Aye. Oh. Okay. Um, next is the uh, budget transfer, the asphalt hot patch trailer. Uh, Jerry, explain this one because. Uh... Yep, I'll explain it. Okay. So, so in in this area here, it's it's basically um, um, we need to um, we need to get a piece of equipment to continue to uh, um, uh, to continue to patch our 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 our, uh, our, um, our potholes. And what we have is we're 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 long on material, um, so we have extra money in our material line. And what we wanted to do is utilize that. Um, and purchase off state contract a, a two-ton uh, hot patch trailer. Uh, we needed an, we needed one anyway. This gives us a, a new one, and now we have a backup one because we never had a backup one. So now we would have uh, two. And this was something that the um, the new assistant um, general foreman and I discussed uh, to try to utilize um, some of the funds in our material line um, to get a, a a second a second trailer out there when we want to try to get more potholes filled in that um, you know period of time when it's not raining or 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 um, you know we're having inclement weather so that's it's what a, it's a spring and autumn thing right well it is I mean it's 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 definitely now uh, and what it does for us now is it, it gets us uh, it gets us more uh, more pothole repair on the street uh, instead of putting one crew out we can put two crews out but then we'll always have a backup now um, which is important because when the other machine goes down for whatever reason, uh, we don't have a backup. And and the cost? Twenty four and change. Twenty four thousand one hundred two off a state contract. And you're taking this out of a uh, material account. Material account. Yep. Out of our current yep. budget, we're not asking for additional money. All right. And and that doesn't impair the increase in costs through the end of the year. No, we're covered on materials, Dan. Okay. We're covered on materials. Okay. So Just move. a different utilization. Uh, we'll take a motion to uh, approve that. So move. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Have your new machine. Thank you. Um, well, however long it takes, right? Well, no, I think I think it's pretty close to uh, getting. It could be delivered uh, within a, a twelve to to twelve to to twenty five day window. So. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, we wouldn't be interested in a long-term purchase like that. Mm -hmm. That's why we wanted to act on it. All right, we need a resolution now authorizing budget transfer for stormwater river cleaning overtime. Mm -hmm. This takes the money that we have in um, river cleaning out of uh, contract services and puts it into overtime um, because we're going to be doing some handwork, mm -hmm. not some, quite a bit of handwork in-house uh, with our existing employees, uh, as opposed to bringing in an outside contractor. Uh, this way, uh, not only do we, um, we get in there uh, during periods of time, you know, afternoons and, and Saturdays, but we also gain a larger understanding of the issues and problems uh, in our waterways uh, firsthand by having our, uh, our staff in there. Of it's course, not worse since this last, um, it's only gotten worse since this last uh, storm. Uh, so yeah. um, it's, it's thirty thousand dollars is all that's left in the uh, in the fund, right? Thirty thousand is what is what's there. Um, all right. I, I think uh, there's a couple yeah. of thousand. I think I left a couple of thousand in there for for some utilization of supplies or or uh, things of that nature. I think we had thirty two five. I just wanted to move the thirty thousand into overtime, so we could use it specifically and only for. Um, stormwater management, utilizing in-house uh, staff, using our staff for in-house work. And, and that's enough in the short term? This would be, oh yeah, yeah, it is. And this would be a primer to bringing in the dredging contractor because we would focus on those areas first. This way the dredging contractor wouldn't have to, mm -hmm. um, they would just focus on the, the heavy work and not the simple light work. And, and we'll address that uh, a little bit later, right? Yep, we'll address that in my report. And this isn't, and this is not a fund. It's a budget line item. It's in our budget right now. The yes. budget line item, not a fund, right? Not okay. a fund. Okay. Not I, a fund. I misspoke. 
I think it's a great idea. I think mm -hmm. glad to see that we're going to use uh, get a better understanding uh, yeah. in our rivers. Um, but I would like appreciate if you could give us a cost analysis of you know the overtime versus you know outside contractor, uh, similar to the other request. It would be very helpful, and then the public would know better. So what the what the challenge would be for me is to find an outside contractor who would be willing to go into the rivers, like a, a landscape company or somebody like that to do handwork and, um, and, and not have, see with our guys, um, they're, they're, the scope of work is um, more known to them because they're experienced with the, the flooding that goes on. They know certain areas, they know people's backyards, they know how to get in and out of areas. So it would be difficult to put this out to bid um, or to um, you know, get price quotes, uh, because I think what we would get is higher prices just because the contractors wouldn't necessarily know what they're getting themselves into. Our, our staff actually, actually uh, you know, would be the ones to just go in there. And so we have an hourly rate for them and it's a fixed hourly rate. So it would be a little bit of a challenge to get a contractor to do the work that I'm asking them to do. But this, this is removal of debris, not cutting trees, moving uh, stone. Right, so it's, it's removal of debris that's already fell, that's already fallen. That yes. kind of stuff, then, yeah. And and and, and I, you know, it, it needs to have happened yesterday or the day before. I don't yep. think we can wait. Stuff sponge up. Uh, um, you know, there's there's logs. Uh, I can tell you behind um, um, Kyle and I saw uh, behind Tulip Tree that development there, uh, logs laying across uh, uh, across the uh, the Beaver Brook um, uh, Creek there that uh, that would have to you know requires handwork. It's not big stuff. It's eight inch, ten inch stuff. But, you know, you have to you have to drag it out. You got to cut it up. It's, it takes a little bit of time to get that kind of stuff out there, of the water. There's also stuff like sinks. I mean, there's sinks. There's we saw parts, today. At, yeah, today at Grove, we saw we saw two recycling those square recycling containers. We saw two of them when we were at Grove Street this morning. So yeah. <laughs> there's a lot of junk around that just needs to get pulled out. Plus, you know, the debris, the wood, the uh, um, the wood, when I say wood, I'm, I'm talking about trees and, and brush that just need to get cleared out. So, and that takes, that takes a lot of handwork. There's no, there's no other way of really getting in there and cleaning that stuff out. Okay, we're, we're grateful you, um, you issued the order. Um, I'm grateful you issued the order, Jerry, and, uh, and uh, would like to, uh, it'll start what, in a week or so or? Oh, right after Easter. After Easter? Yeah, after Easter. Yeah, I wasn't going to commit any weekend work, uh, you know, during the Easter, during the, this Holy Week time. Well, let's hope it doesn't rain between now and then. All right. Yeah, I hope not. You're right. All right. Um, uh, motion to uh, authorize a budget transfer. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Unanimous. All right. Great. Uh, the next is um, abstract of manual vouchers. All right, help me out with that. Augie helps you with that kind of stuff. Okay. Any question? Just ask if any questions or anything. It's basically utilities. Utilities? Utilities and postage, typically. Unless there's any questions from staff, you just motion to approve. I saw nothing in the packet that uh, raised my eyebrows. Uh, I, anybody I, else? I, no? It looks like we're making big progress on the I&I &I bill, but... Yes, but that's that's the next budget. But, yeah. That's the next part. Yes, the next part. All right. All right. Um, motion to uh, approve the abstract of manual vouchers. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Yeah, that's right. Next is abs abstract of uh, audited vouchers with reports. For one million one hundred seventy-eight thousand three hundred four ninety-two. Okay, and that is a. Uh... Yeah, try to ask if anybody has questions. Okay. One million one hundred seventy-eight thousand three hundred and four dollars and ninety-two cents. Um, any questions? No, as as uh, Lou, one one thing as Nora pointed out that uh, we're moving along on the uh, on the sewer project. The first yeah. the first 
you know, the, the first 5.5 million. Mm -hmm. um, we're on uh, we're on our third street, uh, which is Maple, full cut repair. We have five additional streets to continue to do. Um, almost all of the slip lining and the rehabilitation of the um, manholes um, uh, casements have been uh, completed. So we're about uh, we're between 75 and 80 percent complete. The last 20 percent will take a little bit of time because it is uh, heavy, extensive work uh, to do full cut repairs. So basically, you know, going in and removing six inch pipe or abandoning six inch pipe and replacing it with eight inch pipe and then connecting all the houses. Um, and we happen to be doing full cut repair in areas where there's, you know, house to house to house. There's no space in between these houses. They're, um, they're right up against each other. So there's quite a bit of connection uh, work that's being done. Uh, it'll be um, uh, the, the last group of streets. Well, one will be Gertrude and, and, um, and Ralph, and then they'll go into um, Washington area. So they'll do Madison Center and um, Madison Center, and I think Washington um, is where they'll go into, um, and we'll be doing full cut repair in that area there, which is going to require some some special management of the parking situations. Uh, so sewer project is moving along. Uh, and then the, um, uh, I did the final review of the next phase, which is approximately $3 million. Um, and that uh, doesn't look like it has too much full cut repair. It's mostly slip lining. So the next phase is a lot less disruptive for our residents. Uh, it's basically getting around a couple of trucks uh, as they park and do the slip lining. Um, uh, in our uh, in our village, um, but that's uh, that's something that will uh, probably probably happen right uh, right towards the end of the summer, maybe mid early early mid fall. Uh, we'll start. And the time to, frame on this uh, phase. This phase, we'll we'll we'll, we'll anticipate if they if they can continue to move along, uh, we'll probably have it done. I think we have another. Uh, I think it was sixty eight or sixty nine days left for the next uh, um, um, group of roadways. So we're looking at, you know, we're looking at three plus months. Okay. So by the end of the summer, beginning of fall, we'll have this phase done, of which everyone knows we have a $4.9 million grant, uh, which out of that 4.9 million, we're, we're on the hook for 1.6, but the truth is it's, it's found money for us because we were gonna bond the entire 5.5. Five. Um, the next phase has been presented to the uh, to save the sound. I think we've um, gotten to a point with uh, the save the sound attorneys where we're now uh, finalizing our, um, our our time with them, which is uh, very welcomed news <laughs> for myself and, and Mr. Bob Spolzino. So, uh, all right, uh, we we need a motion to approve the uh, ordered voucher with reports. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Okay. Mm -hmm. Oh, got to sign them. And Deputy Mayor. Oh, that's right. Deputy Mayor, how about that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That and a couple of bucks to get me on the subway, right? <laughs> All right. Um, old business. Uh, None. None. All right, here you go. Um, new business uh, resolution authorizing bench donation at East Basin of Harbor Island Park. This is another one of these uh, memorial benches. Yep. Um, it, what, uh, make a resolution. I'm going to read it. I can read it. Oh, no, I read it. Okay. Okay, good. Uh, August helped me out here. Okay, good. Uh, whereas um, Mr. Marco Macalso is desirous of donating a bench and plaque to the village of Mamaronek to be placed in the East Basin of Harbor Island Park in loving memory of Marco and Ar Ardeline Macalso. And whereas the quoted cost of the bench and plaque is $2,241 and the bench as a donation must be accepted by resolution of the Village of Mamaroneck Board of Trustees at their discretion. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Board of Trustees accepts the donation for the bench and plaque at Harbor Island Park, honoring Marco and Ardeline Macalso, and be it further resolved that the Board of Trustees on behalf of the village thanks Mr. Macalso 
for this generous gift to the community. Motion to approve. Motion to approve. So moved. Second. Second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. All right. Okay, uh, resolution establishing a fee for commercial fish, fishing charters. Um, two weeks ago, we first heard about this. Um, whereas at their March 28th, 2022 work session meeting, Arbor Master Jeff LaRusso recommended the addition of a fee category to be added to the 2022 Mamaroneck Harbor fees and charges schedule, allowing for the operation of commercial fishing charters out of Mamaroneck Harbor. And whereas, in addition to the commercial fishing charter fee, there would also be an ancillary benefit of additional parking revenue. Therefore, be it resolved that the Board of Trustees hereby approves the following fee to be added to the 2022 Harbor and Watercraft fee schedule as follows. Commercial fishing charter fee, $13,000. Before oh. we move the motion. It's set. Okay. Is, it, is that right? That, that doesn't. That's not written correctly. No, it, it says thirteen hundred. It says thirteen. Yeah, the the comma is in the wrong place. Right. Okay. All right. Well, the decimal is too. No, it's <laughs> it's thirteen thousand dollars. But the question. Uh, thirteen thousand. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, thirteen thousand. The question from the audience also. Okay. All right. Question uh, from you. Uh, I'll go ahead, uh, Dan. Uh, Jeff indicated that this was going to be for the use of a independent work float. Uh, and I think we need to put that in the resolution as opposed so that uh, we don't use the transit dock uh, for this and we don't use uh, the uh, other village docks. Uh, well, I, go ahead. That this would be an independent uh, work float that we have space on that they could use utilize. And I'm all for that, uh, but I think we need to specify that in the resolution. Otherwise, it could be anywhere. Oh, well, th this is just for the, the, the fee. So I think. I, I think I, I, but it's the fee for what? And the fee is. For commercial fishing charter. Yes. And I'm suggesting that it be designated of commercial fishing charter, charter to an independent work float. I. Um... Uh, otherwise, Lou, we can. It, just doing it by that category, it could be used at any dock, and that is not the intent of what we have been told and what we're trying to do. Well, we, we, we can direct our employee uh, however we wish. I don't think we need to put it in the resolution. Uh, I would like to make it in the resolution. So I would like to say, therefore, be resolved the Board of Trustees hereby approves um, a fishing, uh, a fishing charter uh, at an independent workflow. Uh, with the following fee uh, added to the blah, blah, blah. Um, I, I don't see, I mean, what if they have to do it somewhere else uh, um, on an emergency basis? I don't think- uh, it's, it's, not, it's, the, it's not the emergency. It's the, per, the, you're not establishing an emergency. You're establishing something. That's a whole different thing. We're establishing a fee. Suggesting is the concern I have is this- I'm, turn into having fishing charter boats taking up space at the transient dock, which I'm not sure that that is the policy we want to do. It could also take up space at other dock, you know, uh, which I don't think we want to do either. Well, I, I, I may agree with you on that. I just don't think this is the the, uh, the way to do it. I mean, this is just- uh, that Well, you know, that, that, Lou, you're entitled to feel- Okay, that. all right, all right. You, know, uh, you know, uh, you know, I like I didn't, you know, I'm not in favor of the, um, you know, two percent, but I'm, you know, I understand others wanted right. it, so I was happy to let it continue. Uh, uh, my question is, Jeff was very specific about wanting one. You know, there's only going to be one charter, not a lot of charters, and it was going to be in one location. And I think if we put a fee that's vague, people might would. If people applied, let's say five people wanted a charter, how do we say no? Um, well, so um, we, we now have misgivings about this, I guess. No, I don't have misgivings. No, we, don't, we don't have misgivings, but I think what Nora is suggesting is the same thing that I'm doing. If you limit it to an independent workflow, um, that 
means if there's a, if there's no room, there's no room. Period. If there's room, there's room. Jerry, you want to rework this? So, hello. Last yeah. meeting, did we have a timeline where Jeff wanted this? Because we can push it to the next meeting and and yeah, he, get his, his impression. His, if his that's concern, concern was at our last meeting. Yeah. He didn't. He couldn't give them a a relatively quick green light that they would go elsewhere. And there was another. There was another area that would be was considering doing it and you know, you would lose it. That was his concern. So we, we, uh, you know, we asked him if we had to do it, you know, two weeks ago, he said, no, but if you can do it into, you know, at your next work meeting, uh, your next um, board meeting, it would be very helpful. Uh, and then it can be cured. All right. So what do, what are you, what are you asking for Dan? If you give me the, give me the word wording. Okay. Where it says, therefore be resolved that the board of trustees hereby approves the use The following fee. No, no, just a minute. Hereby approves the use of an independent workflow for fishing charters, for, for, for fishing charter boat. And the following fee to be blah, blah. Work float. An independent work float. I think you could put independent work float in the first paragraph and that would solve it. That would be in the whereas. It's not yeah, in the, the whereas isn't. The, the whereas doesn't count in terms of what is operative. It just says that's the reason for doing it, but it doesn't make it mandatory. Okay. But independent wanna... workload um, for fishing charters, right? Yeah, for, for, for a fishing charter boat. So the fee is going to be commercial fishing charter fee at. A transient at the at at the work the independent work. Here's what we have. Therefore, be it resolved that the board of trustees hereby approves the use of an independent float for fishing charter. The following fee to be added to the 2022 harbor the harbor the the following fee for which. All right. To be added to the 2022 harbor and watercraft fee schedule as follows commercial fishing charter fee thirteen thousand dollars that's where right. you have to add the dock commercial so, fishing charter, i think i don't know have the what so can you read it one more time therefore be it resolved that the board of trustees hereby approves the use of an independent work float for fishing charter the following fee for which to be added to the 2022 harbor and watercraft fee schedule as follows. That's yeah. not great. That's not great sentence construction, but I think it holds yeah. up. So I think so it works. That works. Just that we all understand that they're going to get picked up off the uh, off the off the ramp, right? People are not going to go out to the boat. The he's either going to use he's, he's either going to use the public uh, transfer dock or right. you know the transient uh, but he's not right. mooring right. there that's no. It, no you're right that's right yeah. and the, the, the the issue is so it can't be misinterpreted later yeah. on you know by mistake that all of a sudden we're taking public space away sure but, right. the, but the, the the users the public who utilize the fishing charter will use the public the public walkway. Understood. All right. So so okay. we're, we're all happy with that word. It works. Yeah, that works fine. That works fine. Okay, great. All right. So um, I just want to make sure it's thirteen thousand, not thirteen hundred. Yeah, we have to make sure it's thirteen thousand. So I have thirteen. Well, I put thirteen k uh, dollar sign. Is that a, is that? A... Yeah, just. Yeah, we're, we're, read it, read we're it into the record. The okay, all right, all right. Uh, yeah, that's it for the minute. Should I read the whole thing to make it official? Yeah, read the whole whereas, thing. Whereas, okay, whereas at their March 28th, 2022 work session meeting, Harbor Master Jeff LaRusso recommended the addition of a fee category to be added to the 2022 Marinette Harbor fee and charges schedule, allowing for the operation of commercial fishing charters out of Marinette Harbor and Whereas the addition to the commercial fishing charter fee, there would also be an ancillary benefit of additional parking revenue. Therefore, be it resolved that the Board of Trustees hereby approves the use of an independent float for fishing charter. The following it's an indep independent work float. Use of an independent work. I, ha I have it, Trustee Young. Okay, thank you. All right, a work float. 
following fee for which to be added to the 2022 Harbor and Watercraft fee schedule as follows commercial fishing charter fee $13,000. Got it. So move. So moved. Thank you. Second. Is that a second? Yes. All in favor? Bye. All right. There we go. There Let's go, go fishing. Let's go fishing. Yeah. All right. Next, a resolution authorizing additional funding for dock replacement. This is Jones. Jerry, are you doing this? I'll do it, yeah. Okay. So um, so in January, the board authorized $65,000 purchase materials or hardware. Uh, we were purchasing uh, that type of uh, material off a state contract. Um, um, when we, uh, we need an extra, we need an extra, um, uh, I think it's 19,000 and change. I can't remember what the, the number is. Well, um, 19.876 and 80 cents. Okay, thanks. So hold on, let me pull it up because I shouldn't do this from memory. Um, okay, so so now uh, therefore be resolved, the village board amends the January 25th resolution and approval and authorizes clerk treasurer to create a capital budget item for phase two of the dock with a budget of 73,000. Uh, therefore, um, uh, I'm sorry, resolved that the village manager here authorized uh, the purchase of pressure treated wood from HD supply um, in the amount of 27,876.80 on the source well contract 12, 12, 18 HDS. And that's it. Okay. Uh, I'm glad that we're continuing to replace the docks. Um, I do would like, again, I'd like to make a amendment to uh, now therefore be resolved after the first paragraph where it says, and be it further resolved, uh, and to be further resolved that all <clears throat> work be in accordance with all laws and regulations, including ADA. Sounds good. Okay. Yeah, we've done that before, right? Yep, we've done that before. So I'd like to make, I, uh, with that amendment, I'd like to so move the resolution. I second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Next, communication to the board. No uh, visitors. No hands. Not, no hands? Okay. No hands. I guess Glenn's tired. Um, <laughs> That's not possible. All right. Uh, report from the village manager. Give me a second. Let me pull it up. My report is basically um, answering a series of questions from a resident. Um, which I didn't have the time to do today. I was busy going in and out of Manhattan for, um, for personal stuff. So let me pull it up. This way I can read it uh, and get everything set up. Okay, so let's see here. So I had a series of questions regarding um, the um, private contractor that we discussed uh, that, that a group of uh, staff discussed uh, several weeks ago. I did an emergency order to get um, a project of dredging completed uh, in areas mostly outside of the, um, of the Army Corps project. No sense in us going in and dredging areas that the Army Corps plans on dredging. Um, so uh, we spoke to a contractor, it's JT Cleary, out of Brooklyn, um, this contractor, our harbor master, Jeff LaRusso, has worked with in the past, and, and they're probably the largest in New York State, um, from what everyone is, is telling me. Um, the experience of cleaning rivers um, to flood mitigation. So, so this company, I should tell you that this company gets hired by the Army Corps of Engineers to do work and dredging for them. That's the kind of company this, uh, this is. They do a lot of work of course, in New York State, because we're not um, we're not the only ones who flood in New York State. There's a lot of communities that flood in New York State, but they also do work in the Hudson River and in other areas. Um, they work with the Army Corps, um, so I know that they know how to work with the Army Corps um, in the event that we have to correspond with the Army Corps for any questions or issues. Um, one of the questions that the uh, resident had asked 
is who and how will will uh, will we communicate uh, to the Army Corps regarding the scope of work uh, that we're looking at. And I'll explain the scope of work in a second, and that'll be me. If the board allows me to, to manage the, the Army Corps project, it'll be me. Um, if not, uh, it could be our village engineer, it could be a project manager. I'm not sure if that's uh, been exactly de determined yet. So um, we're writing specs, or we're using the specs, I should say, that we used in 2011. I'm just updating them. Uh, most of the areas are the same that we worked on in 2011 when uh, uh, then manager Slingerland uh, put this work out to bid, um, received, the, um, received the, uh, the, the permits, and we had our, our engineer at the time pull the permits um, from the DEC, which our current consulting engineer is doing now. So uh, I'll have those specs finalized in, in a few days. Um, we discussed with the company um, several ways of, uh, of working uh, as far as getting quotes regarding this. And I'm leaning towards, after reading and writing the specs, excuse me, rewriting the specs um, of a day rate where a crew with equipment would come in, a three-person crew, four-person crew with equipment would come in and access areas, which we will assist them in doing um, to, uh, to do the dredging. The areas that we're talking about that we've done in the past are um, the Mamaronek River from first to the Hillside Bridge. Uh, obviously, the Hillside Bridge is being worked on, and Mr. Sarnoff has reported that there has been some, some work in and around the Hillside Bridge with a contractor. Um, the Anita Lane area, which uh, we're still under investigation uh, because the county did some work there recently. So um, we're taking a look at that area. That's probably an area we're going to do, but that's not set in stone yet. Um, I think we may um, put that as, as a last item. D definitely an item uh, that we're going to do, an area that we're going to do is Grove Street at Hampshire, right on the uh, um, Harrison uh, Village border, um, which uh, has uh, a county. We need county access for that, but we will secure the county access for that like we did in 2011. Um, I was there with um, acting general foreman, and our acting assistant general foreman, uh, Chief Barney and Pablo Ruiz um, today, scoping out that area there. And um, there's a significant amount of, not just silt that has built up, but uh, fist sized stones have been um, gathered in that bend, uh, have gathered up in that bend, um, which is a significant uh, um, issue that needs to be addressed. Bud Walker Park, uh, which is really the community garden along 95, that whole area will be uh, will be addressed, and Rockland Avenue uh, to the Village Salt Shed on Fenimore Road. Uh, other areas will be added um, as we secure access agreements. Right now, all of these areas, and of course, one area that I just mentioned is county, will be assessed, uh, will be accessed. I should say accessed uh, because they're all village-owned properties. Um, but um, if we need to access other areas on private uh, properties, we need to create access agreements for that. And that's when, uh, that's when Mark, our deputy and, and uh, assistant uh, village manager, Dan, uh, get involved in helping me do that. As I said, a lot of these sites have been, uh, focused, uh, have been the focus of dredging uh, in 2007, and they continue to be, uh, according to our observations, uh, issues um, after, of course, Ida. So, um, we're inspecting the rivers. Uh, we're using public access. We're trying to make it simple so we can go in on the first phase and actually get something substantial completed uh, during the summer months. Our dates of, uh, of, of service are going to be May 15th to, to the end of October, and we'll be working every day, weather permitting. Um, we'll, be, we'll be continuing to work um, as we can. Um, the resident asked if, if uh, we will continue to do a quarterly service program to ensure maintenance and prevention. We will continue to do maintenance, but not to this degree. We're not gonna be dredging um, quarterly. Uh, once we get the dredging project completed, we will continue to, um, continue to monitor to see what the, uh, what the impact is of, of uh, rain events, uh, but we definitely won't be doing it quarterly. Uh, we may actually do some dredging annually, uh, and that's something where we'd have to discuss something regarding a budget. Um, right now, I have a tentative budget uh, 
of about 200,000 under the emergency order that uh, we could utilize um, to get uh, most of these areas done. And our engineer in the past has been the village engineer. This time uh, it'll be our um, village uh, consulting engineer, uh, Joe Tremelli and Kellett Sessions. They've already been directed to, uh, to uh, approach the DEC and secure our permits. So what we're doing right now is, as we just approved the $30,000 in overtime, um, we're going to send our uh, force account labor, our, our, our own forces, to go out and do a lot of handwork um, in that period of time as we wait for the permits to be secured. We need a permit from the DEC. We need a permit from the, from the county. Once we wait for those permits to be secured, we're actually going in and doing the handwork, which is really not disturbing anything, but basically just pulling stuff out that has already fallen and, uh, <laughs> and uh, could be clogging up. Uh, once we secure the permits, then we'll bring the, uh, we'll bring the, the dredging crew in uh, we'll probably be, uh, the engineer said, we'll probably be a month, uh, a month out from, uh, from last week uh, regarding our permits. And so um, that's where we'll be. We'll be providing staging for the, uh, for the contractor. They have committed to a crew for the entire uh, summer and into the fall. Uh, I'm not sure how long it's going to take them. I know that they are the best crew around, so I don't have any gauge of uh, how quickly they can get it done. But the quicker, the better regarding, uh, um, you know, our, our, our concern and our anxiety about uh, continuing to have uh, uh, rainstorms, even a, a two inch, three inch rainstorm uh, provides a negative impact for this community. So, um, and those are fairly normal storms. Um, so that's my report. Um, I have everything um, set up where I have all these uh, questions answered. I will provide that to the resident who was asking the question as well as the Board of Trustees, but I'm sorry I couldn't uh, finish out this email today. I was just, uh, I was told not to email and drive in the city at the same time, so I couldn't do it. Yeah. That was good Jerry, advice, right? Good good advice. Dan? Dan? Jerry, great report. Uh, two questions or comments. Um, you, yeah. need, you need permits from the uh, Army Corps as well. I'm sure a couple of sessions would know that. Um, yep. Uh, you need that, and you also, it also includes the Department of State. Those are the easy, easy ones. The second question is, where are you going to relocate the material? So that's a, a question that we have to look at. Um, the contractor said that they would uh, potentially have the ability to remove the material, or we would bank cast it. Um, we looked at some areas. We don't think that bank casting is going to be a, a big option for us, but it is going to be somewhat of an option. Um, so we may have to um, may have to pay to bring the material off site, yeah. and that's where the concern is there. Yeah. On the, going back on one last thing on the permits, uh, from the, you can get ten year permits for uh, for that. I wish I wish so. I'm looking at permits from 2011, and the last time we did this, unless I don't have them, um, we only have permits from the DEC and from the county. Uh, what we will do is we will secure the longest term uh, permits. I do have a, a call schedule with Joe on Wednesday, not tomorrow, but Wednesday. And I'll make sure that we're on the same page. He just needed a couple of days uh, to get some other projects out of the way. Yeah. If I can secure a 10-year permit, I'll definitely go after that. It doesn't look like it. Dan, those permits, Sarnoff, those permits you sent me, they didn't look like, they look like they were specific to the project that, that was presented, right? Yeah, that was the county stream control permit. Yeah. I think they get it was they, they, specifically cited the plans that uh, Keith Fury had prepared back back then. I'm not sure the county will give a tenure, but you can get from core in the state. But oh. but you but you do need the core. Um, whether, whether they did that in the past or not, I can't. I'm not going to. Yeah, it doesn't look like they did, but I'll, I'll do it. That's an easy. That's an easy. It, it's 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 a relatively simple thing, you know for. For upland, Jerry, uh, did, relocation. Jerry, didn't they instruct us to do this some time ago? The core? Yeah. No, I don't. I don't remember that. They, what they said was the only thing that they said was, and what I've read in the reports is that we have to provide a, a maintenance, a, a, a maintenance program after they've completed the project. These right. are areas outside of the, mostly outside of the core, the core project area that we're focusing on. No sense in, in, like I said to you before, no sense in us going into an area and that the core is going to 
you know, doing their project because the core is at zero cost to us. So. Yeah, but but it might rain before they get there. Um, what what what, uh, right. what it might when rain do before think, they get there. When do you think that uh, uh, they'll begin? Uh, really begin? May fifteenth. Yeah. Really. May fifteenth. Yep. No 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 no. I'm talking about the core. Yes. The core. Oh, I don't know. Well, 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 so, so, so the all those questions should be asked on May 18th when we have the uh, when we have that 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 big uh, meeting in at the Emlyn. Okay, all right. Because they it, it, they it, told it, me it, they weren't going to present anything until 60 percent, but yeah. you know a lot of a lot of motivation from the community has gotten them to uh, to you know to bring uh, to, to to show up on the 18th of May, which is you know 30 it, it, days two, away. So is 200,000 enough? No, so that's a tentative budget. That's a tentative budget. Let me, let me, uh, um, so Lou, my thing is I don't like to talk numbers in public meetings. So let's just leave it at that. And then we'll talk about, you know. Well, what do we need to do? If I say do? half a million, my contractor may come back and say, hey, it's going to cost you half a million. I'm a little leery about that. All right, well, what, what do we need to do to, to, uh, to, do we need to transfer some money to make it available or do you? Not yet, no? not yet. Because it's an emergency, I can move forward with the quotes and the discussions and the permits and all of that stuff. Okay. And then when I have something, I'll come to the board. All right. And, but we'll and, keep and, it. We'll keep the numbers vague on purpose for now. Okay. My, my concern is that if the if, if the 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 core is um, a year or more out on meaningful progress on this, that we may need to do a lot more. Well, um, we can discuss that with the core. Okay. Um, if, if they think that an independent contractor that the village hires is going to be faster, a contractor that they have hired in the past is going to be, yeah. is going to get in faster. I'm not sure how that dynamic plays out, truthfully. So about things for about an hour. We'll figure that out. What about, um, uh, and what about uh, Beaver? Handwork. Oh. Yeah, that's part of the handwork. That's part of the handwork uh, uh, project with our in-house staff. So, so they'll uh, th those folks will see some some work in in, in that in that uh, area. Yep. Also. they'll see a lot of uh, a lot of uh, healthy uh, young men and women in chartreuse shirts <laughs> going through there. All right, that's what they tell me. That color is chartreuse. All right. Yes, I think that's a very good description for it. Right, right. And I think. I'm I like like uh, like periwinkle. People see it in way different colors. It doesn't right. the same to right. everybody. <laughs> green, fluorescent green. They tell me it's chartreuse. So green. All right. Um, I appreciate uh, uh, the 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 prompt work, Jerry. I re uh, we really do. I think I think we all do. Yep. Uh, yep. Oh uh, sure. We'll keep right. we'll keep plugging away at these big impossible projects. Okay. Right. It's. Uh, it's what gets me up in the morning. Is there any location? Yeah. Right, where's the other thing? I'm, I don't have my whole agenda here. Hang on. I've, I've lost, I've misplaced something. Hang on. Um, the next item is, is, is Bob, village attorney. No. Oh, yeah. Okay. Augie. Yeah. No, Augie. Augie. Augie's next. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so I'd like to announce the resignation from ZBA board, uh, Meg Jurgen. I'd like to thank you for her service. A volunteer service on that board as well. That is all. Okay. Uh, village attorney, Spalzino. Mr. Deputy Mayor, local law number three, if you recall, that was the law which prohibits the use of cannabis in the village's parks, was filed with the Secretary of State and became effective on February 28th. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, minutes, commissions, board committees, uh, minutes of the board of trustees work session and regular meeting March 28th and budget work session March 30th. Um, I have one thing to note, and I, I should have mentioned it before now, Sally. Uh, there was a, uh, a talk of a, of a possible grant from the from NYSERDA, and I think it was $5,000, not $10,000. Correct, it's 5000 you're right. Yeah, yeah, Thank yeah. You. All right. Uh, uh, other than that, um, uh, move to approve the minutes. But we don't need to approve them. We don't need to oh, is that now? You no. just read them. Oh, we just read them. Sorry. They're just accepted for the record. Thank you. <laughs> okay. And then the minutes of the planning board meeting, March 9th, 2022. <laughs> 
Right. Same thing. Okay. Just accept so, that. What? That's it? Okay, okay, good. We're finished? Motion to adjourn. Hmm? Motion to adjourn. Thank you. Motion to adjourn. So move. Second. Second. Thanks, everyone. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you. you for your help, uh, Dan and uh, Nora. Appreciate it. You're very Thank welcome. You. Good Take job, care. Nora. Night. Bye.